um, huge for agreeing, agreeing to speak. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Good. Okay, so that, that's sharing okay, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Good. Now I've got all the speakers as a little strip above. I don't think it's cutting anything off though. Good. So, um, as this is a, a, only the opening anyway, it doesn't matter if people come halfway through. I'll, I'll, I'll get started then so we can keep to time. Well, uh, my name is Mark Pallon. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our Darwin Day 2022 at Norwich Research Park. Uh, this is the fourth of these events that we've organised, um, and this is the second one that we've done as a virtual event. Um, and uh, this time around, we're going to talk about uh, Darwin evolution and climate change as the, the theme. And I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to the topic. I'm probably not worthy of giving such an introduction, but that doesn't usually stop me. So I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so just to outline uh, the, uh, the programme for today. So we have two sessions. Um, in the first, I'll be talking first of all, and then let me just control that. Yeah, I'll be giving a quick introduction and then chairing the first of the sessions where we have two talks on the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, one from Steve Jones, a former colleague of mine from the University of Birmingham, and one from John Todd, who works at the Natural History Museum in London. And then we're going to have a, a short break, and then Tracy uh, will take over as session chair, um, and we've got Professor Nancy Knowlton, who's going to talk about coral reefs and climate change, so coral reefs and atolls, something very close to Darwin's heart. Uh, she's from the Smithsonian, the National Museum of History, uh, National Museum of Natural History in Washington. And then Ali Fillimore is going to um, give us a talk about time it right in, in, in a change in climate, about uh, phenology and how the timing of biological events like migrations and flowering and so forth change as the climate changes. And then Trace is going to, to do a wrap up. Uh, we are recording this event so that those who are not able to make it now will have the chance to look at it. So bear that in mind if when you ask questions that you are being recorded. And we're assuming that you were sent to that by being here. So, first question is, well, hang on, why are we talking about all this earth science and geology uh, when we are celebrating Darwin? And although we uh, recognise Darwin as uh, a naturalist primarily, and primarily because of his theory of evolution. In fact, he was a, a, a geologist of considerable uh, accomplishment as well. Um, and that's um, been summarized in this book by Sandra Herbert a few years back, where, where she pointed out that, you know, in the history of geology, Darwin was a major figure too. The problem when you look at uh, climate change or any kind of uh, mass extinctions and things like that, if Darwin wasn't right in this area, it's kind of a, a tricky thing. Darwin lent very heavily on Charles Lyell, the principles of geology from Charles Lyell on board the Beagle and devoured it. And the whole uh, breakthrough that Charles Lyell made was uh, this idea of uniformitarianism, and you can see there as the subtitle of his book, an inquiry how the former changes of the Earth's surface are referable to causes now in operation. Um, uh, uh, that's often um, summarised the, the idea that the present is the key to the past. Um, and uh, so the idea that there were catastrophes in the past that wiped out all or most life was something that Darwin was very much uh, sceptical of. And in fact, even uh, before he wrote The Origin Species, way back in 1844 in his essay, there's a note in the margin, better begin with this, that species really, after catastrophes created in showers, showers world over, my theory false. And if we look at um, what he wrote actually uh, in The Origin of Species, it's the 1859 edition here, um, I, I put some extended quotes there, but let's just look at the, the bits in red. The old notion of all inhabitants of the earth having been swept away at successive periods by catastrophe is gen very generally given up. Um, and as a gradualist, he was 
are adamant that species and groups of species gradually disappear. Now, of course, he had to look at the, the, the geological record and make sense of that. And so he does accept, as you can see a bit later on in that chapter, because he had a whole section on extinction in the, in the origin. He says, in some cases, however, the extermination of whole groups of being such as of Ammonites towards the close of the secondary period has been wonderfully sudden. So you kind of think, oh, maybe he is moving towards accepting uh, uh, mass extinction events. But his explanation for that, for the uh, disappearance of trilobites and so forth, was really that there were so many imperfections in the, in the fossil record, the wide intervals of time between our consecutive formations. And in these intervals, I mean, it mean much uh, slow extermination. And so it, this, this is one area where Darwin didn't quite get it right, you might argue at least, uh, although it is still quite a hot topic in evolution. Um, um, he didn't have much to say about climate change either. He did talk about climate as an effect uh, on, uh, as a component, in fact, of natural selection. And he says here, the action of climate seems at first sight to be quite independent of the struggle for existence. But insofar as climate chiefly acts in reducing food, it brings on the most severe struggle between e individuals. So he does, he does, but he was more interested in times of extreme cold, um, which as he pointed out in, in one particular winter, 80% uh, of the birds in his own grounds died because it was cold. Um, of course, the idea of global warming um, does have um, roots back in the uh, 19th, 1820s, they create, propose green, the greenhouse effect to explain why the Earth's temperature is higher than one might expect from the sun's energy alone. Um, Darwin's contemporary, John Tyndall, um, showed that water vapor, methane, carbon dioxide could exorbitate radiated heat and re-radiate it within the atmosphere. And he speculated that the changes in the composition of the atmosphere, in particular those gases, may have been the cause of climatic changes in the past, such as ice ages. And then in the late 19th century, Svante Arrhenius, the Swedish um, scientist, modeled the effects of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, and they specifically addressed what happens if you take the levels down or take them up in terms of global temperatures. And then, of course, fast forward, we get to the so-called Keeling curve in the late 20th century, uh, where global warming has, has now become uh, established as an established event. And here's a, a graph showing you um, the rise in temperature um, in recent uh, decades. But of course, um, going back to Lyle, we, we have to look at these things in the um, context of deep time. Um, and this episode of global warming, although in in many ways, always unprecedented because it's caused by humans. Um, but there have been episodes of climate change in the past. Um, uh, and here, just going back over 65 million years, you can see if you go far enough back, you see this so-called Paleo-Eocene thermal maximum uh, where temperatures are much higher than they are now. And that's going to be the subject of the first two talks um, for this session. And here I just grabbed uh, a screen dump from a, a Wikipedia article. It uh, just shows you that there have been numerous climate change events and, and, and extinction events uh, over the, the Earth's history. And so uh, we, we have to sort of question whether gradualism is uh, a universal phenomenon over time. And this has been one of those lively debates, the uh, Dawkins versus Gould kind of argument about punctuated equilibrium versus phyletic gradualism, evolution by jerks, as it's called, versus evolution by creeps, as to whether evolution is Dawkins kind of pointed out that nobody really accepts that it's always going at the same time, but it's always going fairly slowly, probably. Um, and so that, that's basically all I was going to say is just as an introduction to get us started. Um, and now I will stop sharing my screen and pass over to our first speaker. So, Steve, would you be ready to start? Yes. OK, just let me see if I can share my screen. Um, can people see this now? Yeah. Oh, yes. Let me, oops. 
Oh, I've got the spinning Mac wheel. There. Oh, yeah, this, oh, there we go. Now we can see it. Does that look all right? Good. Yeah. So um, I have this um, perspective view of the North Atlantic for a lot of my research talks. Oh, um, I spend a lot of time looking at the North Atlantic um, and actually, the, as we will see later in this talk, it looks like the PETM was um, certainly in part at least driven from this region. Um, so Paleocene, Eocene, as we know, they're two chunks of geological time. Oops. Um, it's worth just thinking a little bit about what the world looked like then, just to set the scene. So the world was recognizable um, back um, 56 million years ago in terms of the position of the continents, but there were some differences. Um, but um, a significant difference is that we were living in a greenhouse world, at, uh, or we weren't, but the, the creatures around then, it was a greenhouse world. So the, the, the diagrams here are showing um, the temperature of the top part of the ocean and the um, temperature of the bottom part of the atmosphere um, relative to modern. And there were significant temperature, um, it, was, it was significantly warmer than it is now. And in particular, Particularly at the poles. Okay, so the the world was much warmer at the at, at the poles at these times. So um, the, this is exactly the same graph that Mark has, that Mark showed before. We know that over the past sixty five million years ago, the dinosaurs died out, and since then we've had a chunk of time called Cenozoic time, and there's been um, quite a lot, quite significant climate change during that period. So it's shown, um, shown on this scale by um, an, ocean uh, an oxygen isotopic measure where um, when you go upwards on this axis, the world was warmer and or it had less ice. When you go down on this axis, it was cooler and or you had more ice. So there's been considerable change across the Cenozoic time, but much of it happened relatively gradually. So the descent from the greenhouse world of the um, early Cenozoic to the ice house world that we live in now happened in a series of stages, but relatively gradual stages. And the, the, the big thing about the PETM, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, is that it's one of the sharpest and biggest spikes on this graph. Okay, so that's, it's, it's the fact that it was a, a major, a significant event that seemed to happen on a short period of time that makes it of great research interest. So I like this slide to introduce the PETM. Um, so much of what we know about it comes, well, uh, most of what we know about it comes from the rock record. And here we see a series of cores from the South Atlantic, actually from the Walvis Ridge in the South Atlantic. And the PETM is marked by this striking color change, which you can see in all of these cores. And what that's showing is that the, um, the sedimentary rock beneath the PETM is full of chalk. Okay, you can see the calcium carbonate content shown on the blue graphs here. And at the PETM, suddenly all the chalk disappears. And then the um, chalk gradually um, reappears or re-establishes re itself in the sediments um, as you go um, forward after the PETM. So that's showing ocean acidification basically. Um, suddenly there was a significant change in chemical composition of the oceans and um, which dissolved um, lots of calcium carbonate, didn't allow it to accumulate in the seabed. Um, we don't just see the PETM um, in the marine record, we see it in the continental record as well. So one example here, the Big Horn Basin, and around about this red, prominent double red boundary there, that's where the PETM is. We also see it even at the poles, okay? So this is just an example the Arctic Coring Expedition in 2004 busy at its work and they recovered um, PETM age sediments showing um, climate change. So what happened during the PETM? Well, we know from multiple temperature proxies um, that are derived from sedimentary records such as this, that there was global warming of um, four to six degrees C and it happened in millennia. Okay, so it's on civilizational timescales. It took longer to recover. Maybe we're talking about 100,000 years to recover. Um, 
And we've seen already from the idea of ocean acidification that the carbon cycle was well out of balance. Okay. Um, in fact, the PETM was originally recognized on the basis of um, carbon isotopic curves here. You get a sudden lightning it goes negative on the carbon isotope scale, which is very significant as we'll see later. Um, the hydrological cycle, there were big changes in that. Um, and they, in some places, the world got wetter. Um, in other places, the world got more arid. And there's evidence um, in some um, cores that we can see for increased erosion and increased runoff. And I've just got one slide here, not that I'm going to describe this slide, but it's a, a flag to what John's going to say. He will talk in much more detail about um, the biotic response to this event. Um, there were some extinctions, a lot of extinctions in the kind of planktonic world, and there was um, overturn of species and migration of species. So I'll leave that all to him, really. But the, the bottom line is that we think with this series of um, responses, we think that this was an event which was a, a global warming event that was driven by um, supply of carbon-based greenhouse gases to the ocean atmosphere system. Um, and those gases included CO2, carbon dioxide, and also methane. And um, we... There's a lot of effort, research effort going on around the world now and for the past few decades to study this event because of its potential um, use as a partial analogue for modern warming. So these two, this is um, a reconstruction of the um, carbon emissions on the PETM, which we'll talk about in more detail later. But importantly, the vertical scale is the same here as uh, this, this, this modern record. So. There are differences, okay, which do make it a bit difficult to have a direct comparison. There was a lower emissions rate in terms of carbon flux. We've seen that the world was different, you know, it was much warmer then, so we were in a different background state. Any geological um, deep time record is going to suffer from having a coarser temporal resolution in comparison to the modern records. But there are some potential advantages of looking at deep time. Um, a big one is that with this record of the PETM, we can see the entire warming and recovery. Okay, And of course, that's not possible today because we're trying to guess what will happen going into the future. But the big issue is that in order to actually exploit this geological record of warming and recovery, what we really want to do is to try and find out something fundamental about how the carbon cycle changed through that through that time period and that's actually really difficult because at the moment um, or certainly up till the last few years there's been a lot of uncertainty over the source of carbon for the PTM and so there have been various um, ideas floated as to where all that carbon came from that involved maybe methane hydrates or wildfires or permafrost or kind of volcanic basically and or deeply intruded or, or erupted um, um, magma. So if we try to fingerprint the carbon source for the PETM, what are the, what are the key observations? So there are two really, and they trade off against each other. So one is the isotopic composition of the carbon that was um, somehow entering the ocean atmosphere system. And that trades off against the total mass of carbon that was um, th th that was supplied, such that either you can explain, try to explain the PETM by a relatively small mass of isotopically very light carbon, or you can explain it with a much, much larger mass of isotopically heavier carbon. Now, um, the original work on the PETM was really done on the basis of carbon isotope records. So we only had one constraint, okay, and that was on carbon isotopic composition. And maybe for that reason, you know, they were concentrating on the very um, isotopically light end um, mechanism there, which might explain the climate change event with the smallest amount of carbon. And so um, the leading horse in the race was the methane hydrate horse. Now you've probably heard of these ice-like sort of clathrate form of, um, of methane. It holds a lot of methane immediately beneath the seabed. 
Um, it's very environmentally unstable, subject to small changes in seabed temperature or pressure by a sea level change. You can release this stuff to the atmosphere. But there are problems with that. And one is that, of course, we weren't in the modern world. Uh, we were in a greenhouse world. And would really there have been a significant global inventory of methane hydrates beneath the seabeds in a greenhouse world? Um, there's some doubt about that, but more um, seriously and significantly for that hypothesis, um, over the past few years, there's been a lot of work to model the, um, carbon, the, the carbon cycle throughout the PETM. And kind of the state of the art now is to use um, sort of ocean atmosphere models of intermediate complexity. So some of these were developed in UEA um, back, in the, the, back in the day. Um, and in, the great thing about these models is that you're matching not only the carbon isotope records, but also records um, that can constrain the total carbon mass. So in this case, a pH record across the, um, um, the PETM event, which is derived from boron isotopes. And we won't look at the details of this, but basically that because you're then matching multiple data sets, you can resolve this trade off. It gives you both the carbon isotopic composition of emissions and also the mass and the flux of the emissions. So on this graph, over time, you know, over the past few decades, we've evolved from saying, OK, the PETM was probably driven by a small amount of very isotopically light carbon to the the, the paper I just showed you, um, which is many people feel is about the best estimate we've got at the moment, we're actually looking much more like a much larger amount of carbon and it's isotopically much heavier. Okay. And that really leads us on to this diagram, okay, which is that to explain that large amount of isotopically relatively heavy carbon, we really have to be looking at volcanoes. We don't, that's, that, that's the most obvious place where this carbon could have come from. So how can we explain how the mantle via volcanoes could have driven climate change in the geological past? So this is where my research interest comes in. Um, I've spent a lot of time looking at mantle processes. So the mantle is the layer of earth beneath the crust and the tectonic plates and above the iron core. So it's volumetrically the most um, significant component of the earth. And it does, although you may not realize it, affect the biosphere, the, the ocean and the atmosphere significantly. So I like to show this map um, when I'm kind of introducing how the mantle affects us. This is showing you the topography of Earth's surface at the present day that's actually um, supported by the mantle. Okay. So there, um, there are three things that I want to point out here, really. And one is that every part of Earth's surface is colored on this map. It's either red or blue. Okay, so there is no part of Earth's surface which mantle processes don't really affect at present. Okay, it's a, it's a pervasive um, effect. And the second thing to point out is the, is the scale here. Um, it's labeled dynamic topography and it goes from minus two kilometers to plus two kilometers so that's we're talking about the surface elevation effect that the mantle is causing at present is kilometer scale of the of the scale of sort of mountain ranges caused by um, by horizontal plate motions and tectonics and the third thing that i want you to look at is that the biggest colored splodge the biggest red splodge on this map is here in the north atlantic center on iceland OK, and we are actually sitting on the edge of it right now. So if you don't believe that the mantle has much of an effect on your life, um, this is what the UK would look like if we didn't have um, dynamic support from on the edge of this kind of Icelandic mantle convection cell at present. We would all be underwater. So actually, I when, when looking when looking for Darwin quotations, I came across this one daily. It is forced home on the mind of the geologist that nothing, not even the wind that blows, is so unstable as the level of the crust of this earth. Now he was, you know, he 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 wasn't really distinguishing between the effects of horizontal um, tectonics that most of us kind of know and understand and the effects of support from the mantle beneath. But um, we'll see that it's actually very true of the mantle, I think. 
So this pattern of red and blue splodges is supported by motion within the mantle. Okay, now the mantle is solid, and this confuses high school students and even undergraduates. The mantle is solid, we know that because it transmits seismic S waves, but through geological time, it convects vigorously as a fluid. Okay, and this process is called mantle convection. And in some places you have hot material rising up from deep below, quite how deep is debated, but deep below, and it pushes the, um, the surface of the plates up. And in other places you have cold material sinking down and that pulls the um, plates down. Okay. Now, the relationship with volcanic activity is that when these convection cells within Earth's mantle, when they initiate, they don't last the age of the Earth. They maybe they have a finite age, maybe a few hundred million years. And when these things initiate, they cause episodic huge outpourings of lava. And these are called large igneous provinces. We see them in the geological record all over the world. But the one that we're concentrating on today is the North Atlantic igneous province. Okay. So when I'm doing this talk, um, in a lecture theatre in front of people, we have the guessing game element where I say, oh, well, where is this? Who wants to shout out? But of course, you can't really do that online. But I'm sure many of you will know that that is Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. Um, this is a map, BGS map of the, um, of, of, of the North Atlantic Igneous province. Um, fewer people tend to get this one. This is up in the Hebrides. Um, the Isle of Skye, and we're looking there at the Black Cullen Ridge and the Red Cullen here in the foreground. And for climbers, here's the inaccessible pinnacle, the in pin, which is um, a feature of that Black Cullen Ridge. So this was a magma chamber, uh, basically, that um, is part of the North Atlantic Indies province in the sky. And most of the North Atlantic province is actually offshore and much of it buried. So here is the island um, that some people sometimes get. It's Rockall, sticking out above the, the sea. Um, and this is a map of the whole North Atlantic Igneous province. So it's like a sort of summary map, if you like. So the North Atlantic Igneous province, kind of the act activity began towards the start of the Paleocene, maybe about 60 million years ago. And we saw then some of the formations in the Hebrides, Northern Ireland. Um, but the main period of activity um, was actually slightly later. It spanned the Paleocene in boundary. And at that time, Greenland was attached to Northwestern Europe. And the main phase of activity of the North Atlantic province actually coincided with breakup of, or separation of Greenland away from Europe. And there was also a large amount of uplift that happened at that time. You can see the coastline sort of stepping out, a land bridge appearing. So that will be relevant to John's talk, I think, later. And all of these, this uplift and this huge outpouring, both of those were being caused by this mantle process that was the sort of development of this um, convection cell that is now centered on Iceland. And if you, this, association between the North Atlantic Igneous province and it spanning the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. That is one of many examples through geological time, which Mark referred to in his list. This is basically a graph of Mark's list, really, of um, relationship between large Igneous provinces and global catastrophes. And some of those are mass extinctions, such as the orange ones here, but some of them are climate change events, warming events in the case of the PETM, and some of them are ocean anoxia events. So there's a range of different sort of um, expressions of global catastrophe, but large igneous provinces always seem to be correlated with them. Um, so it raises the question, well, it looks like, or there is a hypothesis that large igneous provinces can potentially cause global warming and other climate change. How does how do these things put carbon into the atmosphere? And there are two main mechanisms. And one of them is that lava directly releases carbon dioxide. So you can see the gas coming out of these volcanic vents here. It contains a large amount of CO2. And the reason for that is because Earth's mantle has trace amounts of carbon in it. 
it got there by ocean sediment settling out on the seabed containing carbon and then that gets put back into the mantle via subduction zones but the carbon is incompatible in the mantle it doesn't want to be there and so the first initial parts of melting um, to make new oceanic crust the, the carbon gets spat out again and the second and less intuitive um, source of, of, um, of carbon of, of carbon um, here's another guess that I that I get people to make we've got a wall snaking across a cliff here so that's Hadrian's wall and it sits on top of the great wind sill okay so that's not actually part of the North Atlantic Indies province but it is an example of an intrusion a sheet like intrusion of magma not all of magma kind of reaches the surface when it erupts some of it stalls within the upper part of the crust and when it does so it cooks the host rocks surrounding those igneous sheets. And if they contain um, trace amounts of organic material, that material is thermally matured and generates methane. It also generates oil as well. And in fact, that thermal maturation process is how we get oil and gas generally, is how we get oil and gas reserves. Okay. And not only does it generate methane, it also, um, via a kind of natural runaway fracking process, hydrofracking process, it causes expansion and boiling of the natural pore fluids and that causes hydrothermal vents blasted to the earth to, to, the, to the surface which can release these um, the methane so if you're not convinced by that the answer is well we can actually see this happening and we see it using seismic reflection data okay so this is a kind of echo sounding data which we use to map the interior the shallow interior of the earth and it's this data that forms the basis of the energy industry basically the oil and gas industry and then it's kind of modern maybe more carbon sequestering version and here is some seismic data from offshore the rock oil trough in the north atlantic igneous province and you, we can see these igneous cells this is what they look like kind of highly reflective patches okay and there's a whole load of them shown here and we can measure their characteristics and i'm not showing vents here but we can actually the best data does show hydrothermal vents and these things have been dated the rocks the, the, the igneous sill rocks and the hydrothermal vents there's a lot of them appear round about the paleocene boundary okay so but there's a there's a kind of elephant in the room here isn't there really and that, which is not just for the North Atlantic Igneous province in the PTM, but for all, um, you know, this, coral, this general correlation between large igneous provinces and climate changes. And that's that the igneous activity spans millions of years. Okay, so if you look at, we've got the vertical axis of this plot is in millions of years. And if you look at an individual Hebridean island, for example, we're talking, you know, several millions of years for the peak in igneous activity there. Now, that igneous activity does in general span the sort of the general time period when the PETM is happening in this red line, but the PETM itself was much shorter. You know, the onset was around about 10 millennia, possibly less. So the big question is, you know, if it, it, it looks like if we were to explain the PETM by the North Atlantic Indies province, we have to be able to postulate some sort of pulse of strong, much stronger than normal igneous activity within that large igneous province. And that raises other questions that how ultimately that magma is all being generated by a mantle process. And how can a rocky layer, you know, move so fast as to melt that fast as to create such a you know rapid amount of volcanism and that's a massive that's a massive question you know so but finally in the past few years we're getting somewhere on that and the answer or a clue again comes from seismic reflection imaging so this is another quiz that i will give to people if you were all sitting here in front of me so one of these is a modern digital elevation model of um, actually part of the the, the usa San Andreas Fault Zone, and the, the other is an ancient buried landscape that's been reconstructed from the interior of one of these seismic cubes. And I ask people to guess which is which, and people, it's always 50-50, which just really goes to show 
the quality of the seismic imaging. But actually the ancient landscape is the top one here. So this is a landscape, a subaerially eroded by rivers landscape that's now buried deeply beneath the Faroe Shetland Basin offshore the UK. So there. And I'm not going to go into detail as to how we re reconstruct these curves, but based on the sort of geomorphology and of this landscape correlated with careful um, biostratigraphy, we can get a vertical motion curve for this landscape. Okay. And the time scale is in million years here. And the key point really is that the peak, is, well, first of all, we're talking about very significant uplift here, like kilometer scale uplift to create that buried landscape. And also the time period, look at the rate of change of this, of these vertical motions, they're really steep. So there's action happening well within a hundred um, thousand years and down to the required time scale. There's the significant action happening on sort of certainly tens of millennia. So it does give, and this is the uplift that's accompanying the, um, the igneous activity. This is the uplift that's being driven by mantle processes. So we do have evidence to say that mantle processes are happening much more rapidly than most people would expect. So how, how can that be? Because, you know, how can the rocky mantle move so fast? And the key to that is a process called mantle plume pulsing, actually, we think. So if you look at this, it's rather a slow grainy animation. But can you see this mantle plume here? Can you see here a little blob sort of detaches from the lower thermal boundary layer and shoots up the stem of the plume? Okay. Um, mantle convection is inherently unsteady. And that's not just mantle convection, that's any high Rayleigh number convective process is an inherently unsteady. And um, that leads to this phenomenon called mantle plume pulsing, where hotter and cooler blobs are being advected up the the stem of the mantle convection cell, and then they pass through the, 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 the head of the convection cell. And again, I'm not going to go into details with this, but we can see that process happening right now in the sea floor beneath the um, uh, south of Iceland. So we know that these that the Icelandic convection cell has these blobs. And my research group have been taking this mantle processes approach to try and see whether very rapid passage of these hot blobs beneath the North Atlantic could have generated that. Um, the igneous activity on the required time frame. So the idea is that a hot blob came up underneath um, Britain and the north, north, the northwestern Europe in the very, very latest Paleocene and then spread outwards beneath the plates like ripples on a pond. And so the, you know, a question arises, well, can we actually see that happening? Now, this process is recorded by the changes in um, oceanic crustal structure. Basically, mid-ocean ridges record very small and even much bigger temperature changes in the mantle um, going on underneath. And so a couple of years, well, actually last year, I had um, an expedition to go and try and find the crustal trace of this putative PETM forming volcanic pulse. And we went out from Ireland to this very poorly explored area um, southwest of Rock or Plateau to a place called Eriador Ridge. Um, and there's the boat and here is the crew. So this was a nightmare to organize in the middle of the lockdown last year, but we did manage to do it. We did set sail and we did get data. Um, and again, in this time, this talk, I haven't got time to go through this, 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 this in great detail, but the bottom line is we do see a ridge, this molar-like ridge here, is the pulse of volcanic production um, of Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum age. Okay. So it does look, at least in principle, as if this thermal plume pulsing idea can potentially explain um, the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And so um, kind of tying things, beginning to tie things back up again to actually how we, you know, can use this to inform climate change and maybe think about the present. Um, we're now in the situation where we can do simulations of North Atlantic igneous provinces. And this is one of them. Um, we published a few, a few years ago, actually. So this is a simulation of the North Atlantic sill province, igneous sill province. Okay. So here's the UK and Greenland. And this white stripe is Rock or Trough, Ferris Shetland Basin, 
basins off, offshore Norway. And each one of these red spots is an individual igneous silt being intruded. So this is a stochastic model and it's kind of underlain by statistics based on the seismic data we were looking at before. And time frames kind of based on the, those uplift um, surfaces that I showed you before. And each individual sill doesn't last for very long and doesn't produce very much methane or CO2. But together, if they all intrude within a short enough time period of each other, the cumulative emissions are significant. OK, and we can compare the cumulative um, emissions from models such as the one I just showed with completely um, separate estimates of greenhouse gas emissions from um, sediment cores. And that's what's shown here. So you've seen this diagram already. So the blue line here, that is um, a core-based reconstruction. I called it a sink-based estimate there. That's a core-based, sedimentary core-based reconstruction on the basis of a kind of global carbon cycle model of the greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. On the red, is my completely separate or our completely separate um, reconstruction of what the North Atlantic Igneous province could have emitted. And the bottom line here is that there is actually quite a close match or potentially quite a close match between these between those two curves. So potentially large Igneous provinces can generate the required amount of um, greenhouse gases in terms of the flux and the mass and mantle processes can potentially cause these changes in greenhouse gas flux fast enough to maybe explain the PETM. Now, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty and the main uncertainty is the vigor of the mantle convection um, cell. Um, so we've got, there's more work to be done on that. And it's still too early to say whether the North Atlantic Igneous province alone could have done the whole job or whether it, kind of provided a background um, a background sort of um, situation and then other feedback processes were which which, which made them able to actually cause the, the PETM. So that's what we're working on at the moment. But kind of just beginning to wrap things up now really. Um, I think we're getting to the stage or the, 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 the great excitement is really that we're getting to the stage where you know we've got the PETM as an entire record of the warming and recovery. And now we do actually, there is growing global consensus, certainly that it's large igneous province carbon is a big player here. And added to that, we've now beginning to develop a physical understanding of how that might actually happen. So I'm not saying that this red curve is the answer right now, but it's, I think over the next five to 10 um, years, you know, but we will get a curve like this that m most people would be happy to sign up to. And that is really exciting because it gives the potential to reconstruct carbon cycle feedbacks. Because if you've got um, a separate, two separate records of flux, one of them from a sort of sedimentary core based record that's showing the response of um, the ocean atmosphere system, and one is the source function, for example, from, from um, from those simulations that I was showing before, then the gap between those is the feedback in the in the in the carbon the carbon cycle. And what we really are interested in is: are we in the situation, or were we in the situation on the left, where there was a bit of a kick from an igneous um, source, but that really wasn't doing the main job? Then a whole series of positive feedbacks within the climate system took over and generated the the, the PETM response. Or are we in a situation where actually the response was quite closely coupled to the um, to, to, to the the igneous forcing um, and the actual feedbacks and maybe potentially harmful tipping points in the climate system here were 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 less than we might worry about, and it's this kind of understanding of the carbon cycle that I think is really going to be um, you know useful in when we're thinking about what's happening at present and what's happening going forward. So I guess. Just to end, from my point of view, um, I can't actually read this because it's right. So, you know, Darwin, Mark was mentioning this, you know, we marvel when we hear of the extinction of an organic being. We don't see the cause, 
So we invoke cataclysms to desolate the world or invent laws on the duration of the forms of life. He didn't really like this idea of, you know, sudden, sudden changes. But actually, I guess, from my point of view, you know, if you take the long view of mantle convection, actually, this is a completely normal process that's happening the whole time. And it's just, you know, this, this kind of high Rayleigh number convection system, for example, has just blobs that go around it. And that's just, that's just the norm. So, um, well, I guess it's food for thought, really, that we can consider how, but I think we're really beginning to develop an understanding um, over maybe, and we'll do some more work on this over the next five to 10 years, as to how we explain this kind of episodic or punctuated equilibrium um, um, geological record in terms of both large igneous provinces and maybe in terms of um, the environmental consequences that go with them. So I think that's really all I've got to say. Is that about the right amount of time, Mark? Yeah, that's fine. Um... Just slightly overrunning, but we can probably probably what we could do is pick up questions at the end of the session, so that then we eat into the um, yeah. the tea break. Um, yes. I mean, I, I do have one question. You've got the Deccan traps there at the end mm -hmm. of the Cretaceous. Yeah, are they still thought to have a role in mass extinction, or you think it's just the the asteroid that did that? Well, I I think. Um... So I, I think there is globe growing consensus that large igneous provinces do have a serious a serious role in all these things. So I think the, the bottom line is people think that there's that both are involved in Decamp. So there are there is certainly um, good evidence for significant and short term carbon emissions at the time of the Decamp as well. Um, and then we know that there was this asteroid impact as well. So both of those seem to be in the mix for the decamp. Okay. okay. Good. Okay. Well, I think we should, in the interest of time, move on now, and uh, I'll pass over to Dr. Todd, who's going to talk to us yep. uh, about the effects of the uh, of the PETM on evolution. You're, you're muted. <laughs> you're still muted. John, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm, just having, I'm just having confusion here. Uh, okay, that's common when <laughs> Zoom calls, I know, <laughs> even though we've been doing it for two years. Yeah. Um, I did have everything set up and of course I just lent on a button and we've lost what I wanted, which is the talk. Okay. Yeah. It will it will reappear. It will reappear. Um, well, while you're doing that, we could take if there are any questions that anyone wants to ask Steve, uh, put your hand up or just speak. Oh, it doesn't look like there are any. Um, what I like. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Share screen. We kept there. getting there. Except so you're getting the, uh, that, that world you get on a Mac that the sort of <laughs> sort of death where your computer programs crash oh. and you can yeah, get a recovery. Let's see where we are. Okay. Can you see that now? Not yet. Nope. Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. That's weird. You should have shared that. Ugh. Um, hmm. It's saying that all, I've just looked at the sharing options. It says all participants can share. So if you click on the little uh, greens, yeah, I'm, I'm rectangle with the arrow in the middle. It's disappeared for some reason. Um, oh. yeah. What on earth is going on? The other thing you might try is to stop um, 
having it open as a full screen and and just make it as a script that sometimes helps to reorientate things yeah sorry everyone well, this is a shame because you tested it out and it's working that's some yeah. sort of cosmic karma that's visiting you yes. in a bad way in a bad way <laughs> um this is very good all right, well, while you're doing that, I'll ask, I will ask Steve a question then. So, Steve, you, you were saying that uh, it, you're kind of in, uh, hinting that, that, that the mental effects are necessary, but maybe not sufficient. So is there any question that there may have been some kind of also related to the thermal maximum? So you just, um, so you broke up then at the end? Oh, I'm just saying that you, you kind of hinted that under some assumptions it would, the mantle effects were all all you needed, sufficient, necessary, and sufficient. But uh, uh, you also said, oh, there might be a situation where they are necessary but not sufficient, and that some other factor was involved. And what was the other fact, fact, kind of factor you're thinking about then? Well, that that remains to be seen. So that would be these sort of feedbacks within the climate system. So it it could okay. potentially be, I. I mean, in principle, it could be another completely different carbon source, like methane hydrates. But I think, um, you know, there are problems with that idea because of the, the, the you know, the carbon isotopic composition as we as we talked about. So I think, I think there's a lot of complexity, as I guess you guys might, many of you guys at UEA might know about how the, the global carbon cycle works, um, and in particular with sort of shallow, sufficient um stores of carbon in bio in in forests and in biomass and in permafrost um and in the way that the ocean stores carbon um, and in the way that the ocean buries carbon certainly in those um sea genie models you can't the difficulty is not so much explaining the onset rate of the of the PUTM but how quickly it goes back again afterwards and that, okay. that really they think implies that there's very significant carbon burial. So they have to take carbon out of the ocean by yeah. just burying it, but there is no consensus as to exactly how that happens at the moment. So I basically, in general, there's a big bucket term called feedbacks within the sort of sufficient carbon cycle. And that's yeah. what we need to try and um, get to over the coming five years to decade, really, I think. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, so are we there? Not there yet, because you've got you're you're showing us what you're kind of going to read out to us, rather yeah, than yeah. you need to go on to the little screen icon thing to the right, don't you? Two to three, third to the right from the view you're looking at now. That's it. And double click on there. We should be all right, shouldn't we? We should be. I'm not quite sure what's been happening here. I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. You just just need to get put it in presenter mode, and then yeah, I think I, I thought I was. Oh dear. No. No. I uh, well, what we can what we can see is um, the first slide. Yeah. Um, but we can only see the bottom of the slide, and we're actually yeah, looking yeah, at your yeah, notes. Yeah. Under your notes as well, yeah. 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 So, so I need to. This is bad. As Tracy said, if you email her the slides, she could do the slides for you. You can just say next slide, please. Well, I. Yeah, I did have it set up, and I'm not quite sure. There is um. And, um, there is a, a it, look, we're flexible on time. So, you know, I mean, have another go. If not, um, email it to me. But in the meantime, um, there is a, a question in the chat, um, which we can go to. So there's a question from um, from Marco. Um, so I'll, I'll read it out. Um, uh, how do you think volcanic activity related changes in land covering surface and greenhouse emissions influence primary productivity in the ocean with particular reference to CO2 sequestration potential operated by primary producers in view of the fact that most of it goes at sea. 
I know you can read that too. Yes. <laughs> well, so that's a very good question that I would like to know the answer to. Um, so, um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we are kind of people are now beginning to try and solve or you know ask ask for the for the PETF. So I don't know is the bottom line, and I don't think anyone um, knows for sure. So people speculate it might have done this, it might have done that, but I guess that is exactly an example of one of the sort of feedbacks that I was talking about within the sort of official um, carbon cycle. And it's that kind of thing that needs to be that needs to be understood properly um, as we go forward over the next those the next five to ten years. So certainly we've got plans in, in Birmingham to be uh, we've got like grant proposals still at the moment to be trying to work with people on that kind of thing. It's that 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 question and ones like it are what we need to be asking really. Yeah. I have a I have a question, but we'll just all right. Okay. Oh yeah, we're there. Are we there now? Yeah, we're there now. Mark. Well done. <laughs> well done. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. So, um, did I truncate that question on uh, session? No, no, no. You're, you're free to go okay. on there. Well, <laughs> thank you. I'm um, very sorry about that. And I'm uh, truly honoured to be invited to present at your annual Darwin's birthday. So a little bit about me. I'm a paleobiologist and I'm a systematist and I work at the Natural History Museum. And from a young age, I've had a deep love of animal diversity, um, focusing mostly on mollusks. And I got into studying what fossil mollusks can tell us about climate change through actually working with um, Jeremy Jackson, who uh, some of you will know is Nancy Knowlton's spouse. So, uh, and I was working with him on the Pleistocene extinction in tropical America. But now, um, following Steve's fabulous book, fabulous introduction um, to the North Atlantic Igneous Province, um, that's what I'm going to present on here. I'm going to uh, shift to the North Atlantic and focus on faunal change in shelf mollusks across the BETM. I will say a little bit more about organismal evolution, but in a, in a pretty sketchy way. Um, so, okay, moving on. If anyone missed um, Stephen's talk, um, a very quick refresher of some of the key geochemical evidence derived from um, oceanic borehole data that supports the PETM as a major source of CO2 and methane release. And I think I'm just going straight on. And here's a simple cartoon of today's oceanic effects of anthropogenic CO2 release. Um, and replace the chimneys there and um, get rid of the ice sheet because there was no uh, uh, um, polar ice in the PETM. And really, this is pretty much a, a what was happening in the PETM. You've got in the open ocean, you've got acidification, you've got um, uh, dissolution of um, deep water carbonates, um, basically calcareous forams that live in deep water, benthic forams that are unable to make their tests. And there was a 50% turnover in deep forams. Um, some of the uh, agglutinated forams that make their tests out of um, little uh, sand grains and pieces of silt, they were unaffected. It was just the calcareous ones, so there's good data there. Um, carbonate deposition was replaced by disoxic uh, organic rich clays. Um, and in the surface uh, layers of the ocean there, surface waters, um, uh, there was an increased productivity of phytoplankton and uh, coastal waters, at least in part, were replaced by a thermally stratified uh, sulfide rich soup so pretty unpleasant um, environment for most most organisms so over to global uh, uh, cataclysms when we consider the effect of the PETM on organismal evolution I think this is a really good place to start this is the classic iconic uh, diagram of diversity change through the Phanerozoic that Jack Setkowski uh, derived back in 1984 where you're looking, you're measuring um, diversity in terms of marine families, vertical axis, and then uh, from the Cambrian to the recent, along the horizontal. And you see basically there was a steep rise in diversity in the Paleozoic, a plateau, a drop at the uh, late Permian, 
and then a, a pretty much a slow steady increase punctuated by the KT extinction up to where we are now. And along the top here with the, with the red dotted lines, we have the big five mass extinctions that most, uh, most paleobiologists recognize. And I've added here the Anthropocene with a question mark on the end because there's pretty good evidence that unfortunately we might be entering the sixth. So, um, but what's, what's missing uh, quite clearly here is, and it should be around here, whoops, it should be around, uh, let's just get a, a pointer here. It should be around here is the PETM. So effectively on a global scale, there were no mass extinctions um, of the same order that we uh, see in the big five. So I think um, Steve's already shown this slide and it's um, basically a, a compilation of data um, of global and regional effects of the PETM. And um, for example, uh, if we look at O2 here, basically indicates a, a drop in um, seafloor oxygenation, and that's recorded in boreholes basically globally. Um, and we can also see temperatures here, um, surface seawater temperatures, showing an increase of around five to eight degrees. And again, that's global. And perhaps um, more local increases in sediment supply, marked SS, which is they're particularly noticeable up here in the North, um, North Atlantic. Um, and so the point here, I think, is that although the change um, the PTM affected the whole globe, um, it, it does appear that the greatest change was focused in the North Atlantic, as, as Stephen so ably demonstrated. So this is a very brief overview of the biotic effects of the uh, PETM. Basically, um, uh, we can, from mammals, um, dispersal extinction and radiation of mammals, um, floras move northwards by 100 to 1,000 degrees, 1,000 uh, kilometers. As I've said, deep sea forams extinction. Um, there's actually a rapid divers diversification of uh, benthic forams like this uh, immediately after the PETM. So it's not all doom and gloom. Um, a good marker of the PETM globally is this beast, which is a warm water dinoflagellate cyst, um, a pectodinian. But even here, the story is a little bit uh, unclear because this it also um, marks freshening as well as warming. Nanoplankton um, altered um, their trophic uh, traits and diversification of pteropods. And I'm just going to quickly consider mammals and pteropods in the next few slides. So um, here are the uh, modulated um, highs or uh, uh, land bridges um, that allowed migration of mammals, um, essentially a polar migration at the top there, and uh, migrations from Northwest Europe across to Greenland and the, and the US. So, you know, the mantra of uh, environmental re response to uh, Global catastrophes, of course, migrate, migrate, adapt, or go extinct. And the mammals do all three. They're a really good example. So, what happens? Here are two uh, postulated mammalian migration routes over these land bridges. Number one here is um, from Asia to the US or North America, um, latest Paleocene. And number two, Europe across to the, uh, North America um, in, in the pretty much coincident with the PETM. Now, mammalian extinctions in Northwest Europe at the PETM um, amount to 75% of the species. And these are preferentially of small forest dwelling insectivores and frugivores. And at the same time, there was a migration from the US from um, Bighorn Basin and so on, Green River Shales into Europe of uh, large terrestrial browsers like Corypheidon. And um, there was a shift coincident upon this of uh, forest structure in Northwest Europe from what we think were uh, rather, rather, rather dense forests to likely more open forests. 
Um, an interesting tidbit with regards to uh, adaptation is that in North America, um, in horses, in the horse clade, there was actual dwarfing associated with the PETM and um, a 30% decrease in some species at this point, but then they quickly rebounded in size after the PETM. Um, subsequent to the PETM, subsequent to these migrations, there were major radiations in both Europe and North America, and I've listed them here, horses through to true carnivores and bats. So uh, the story of mammals is um, particularly contingent upon there being these land bridges as well as climate change. Sorry, this is a bit blurry, but um, uh, if we consider oceanic, oceanic plankton, then here's another example of the PETM heralding long-term change. Um, now these cuties are pteropods or sea butterflies, and they're entirely planktonic gastropods, and they flap their little um, divided feet and swim around in the plankton. Um, and they've got transparent, really thin aragonitic shells, and there's a lot of work going on at the present day, a number of research groups looking at the susceptibility of these things as maybe canaries in the coal mine to existing uh, uh, or continuing seafloor um, acidification, uh, sorry, sea column acidification. Um, so these images are taken from work I've been involved in, which has focused on the relationships and diversification of pteropods. Um, and here's a phylogram, uh, much of the slide here at the top, of um, the, uh, a, phylo, a large phylogenomic data set, which is calibrated by the means of fossils. And it reveals, um, really for pteropods, this node here, that they likely uh, uh, originated early in the Cretaceous. Our first fossils are known late in the uh, Cretaceous here. But what's interesting is the crown clades here basically diversify um, coincidentally or basically at the PETM. And soon after the PETM, you have a large number of pteropods found in offshore clays, for example, the London clay. Um, so uh, they become a conspicuous uh, uh, component of offshore, uh, offshore sediments in the early Eocene. And here's a diagram of waxing and waning of larger planktonic organisms since the Jurassic through to the recent. So in the Mesozoic, there's a lot of ammonites, um, but also a rise in planktonic forams. Um, a big, obviously the ammonites disappear at the KT here. Um, but then in the Paleocene, basically the PETM, there's this big radiation of pteropods through to the present day. And at the present day, pteropods and uh, planktonic forams are, um, are major uh, sources of uh, major importance globally in the carbon cycle. So they pull down atmospheric carbon dioxide and uh, um, deposit um, carbon in their shells. And then upon their death, um, it's sequestered in oceanic carbonates. So very important beasts. At the present day pteropods are a, uh, they support um, oceanic uh, food chains and their predators range from krill up to whales, incredibly important beasts. So that's a little bit on pteropods. So in the oceans, the histories of some major taxa like pteropods became reset with the PETM. But what do we know about coastal benthos? Um, now, fairly complete sections through the PETM of uh, shallow marine sediments are known, for example, in New Zealand, Gulf Coast of the US, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Plain here, Egypt, and I've starred it for a good reason, Northwest Europe. But there are problems. For example, in, uh, in New Zealand, the deposits are uh, poorly dated and the macrofossils are fragile. Um, in Egypt and in North America, uh, the deposits are rather sporadically fossiliferous, uh, fairly, uh, fairly good and complete sequences, but um, in some places there are, are, there are basically no fossils actually at the PETM. So what can we learn from these sites presently? 
uh, about actually what happened to Benthos at the PDM. Well, in 2002, Spire and colleagues were decidedly pessimistic. They said, and I'll read this quote, the response of most marine invertebrates to paleoclimatic and associated environmental changes during the PETM is virtually unknown, as continuous high resolution data of these groups spanning the PETM are unexplored or possibly not or hardly preserved. And uh, here for a macro paleontologist, there's a depressing stratigraphic log of the PETM of Egypt, and basically it's completely devoid of, of calcareous fossils. Um, but in the past decade, things have changed um, and work has started in earnest on, on mollusks. So why mollusks? Well, here are five good reasons. Um, taxonomic uniformitarianism really is a fancy term for inferring that extinct taxa were ecologically similar to living ones. And we can use this for extinct mollusks because ecological traits of living mollusks are phylogenetically conserved at, at at least the family level. So it's rather easy to interpret um, bivalves, gastropods, scaphopods, and so on in terms of how they lived, what they did. And let's just consider bivalves um, do lots of different things. So um, across here in capitals, we've got their different sorts of uh, uh, diets ranging from sus suspension feeders, deposit feeders, chemosymbionts, photosymbionts, and even carnivores. Um, differences in motility, some can swim, most, uh, most can crawl or burrow, some are bissily attached, and in fact, some are cemented, and indeed their relationship to their substrates. So some in soft substrates or living upon soft substrates, others cemented to or attached to or living within hard substrates. So there's a lot of different traits there that we can look at um, to get a handle when we're looking at the fossil record and actually what sort of environments we're looking at. So um, in 2018, there was a major study by Linda Ivany and colleagues studying molluscan assemblages um, that straddled the PETM across the US Gulf Coast Plain. And um, the data set here is, is actually rather small. It's less than 12,000 specimens over a 5 million year uh, time span here, encompassing the PETM, which is this, this line here. Um, and they concluded that there were few notable lasting impacts on diversity, turnover, functional ecology, body size, or life history of important clades. Um, that's quite interesting. It's an interesting statement. I don't agree with all of that. Um, but the real problem with this study, I think, is uh, exemplified by this figure, which shows they have only five pooled samples across the Paleocene Eocene. Um, dotted line here is the PETM. And they have no samples within half a million years of either side of the PETM. And the PETM itself is unfossiliferous. So uh, although this study is really interesting, it, 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 it's, it's very little help to us in ascertaining what may occur in today's shallow seas within, say, five or so, so human generations from where we are now. Um, so we have a bit of a paradox here. So in the Gulf Coastal Plain of the US, and I've just shown you the data, there doesn't appear to be a major faunal turnover because actually the PETM lies within the Wilcox group. So it's not the a change in faunas is not reflected in different regional stages. Um, whereas in Northwest Europe, we have the Fenetian and the Apresian stages, which have long been recognized, although they were set up on um, paleobotanically, um, they've long been recognized. Um, on the basis of marine faunas. And so there is a distinct faunal turnover at the PETM, but until now, this has been full, poorly quantified and there's been no real detailed study. So what I want to present today is um, some ongoing work on the PETM of, of Northwest Europe. Um, I'll introduce a new data set that I and colleagues are currently working on. So, so I just look at the North Sea Basin um, because it's got the best studied marine 
Uh, it's perhaps the best studied marine paleogene basin worldwide, and that's due to obviously the hydrocarbon interest. Um, off sea, uh, offshore, we've got a very complete sedimentary sequence through the uh, Paleocene and into the Eocene, and the uh, PETM is just here. And um, also onshore, uh, here in southern England, um, northern France, Belgium, we've also got a, a pretty much the best known and best recorded um, uh, sequence of onshore sediments, which are highly fossiliferous. And these onshore rocks have been known for about 150 years. They've been described and collected. Um, but what we're missing now is a synthesis of our knowledge of the onshore deposits and the offshore deposits, which have been characterized very well by their microfaunas. So uh, for our new data set, we've examined um, so far uh, 24 sample sites in the London, Hampshire and Paris Basin um, and 34 sampled horizons. And basically these are the stratigraphic units we've looked at um, across the late Paleocene and early Eocene. And these are the criteria we've used to select these units in terms of which particular samples are we using. And we've done that to ensure the comparability of facies and faunas over this time. So the Southern North Sea in the Paris Basin especially was a global molluscan biodiversity hotspot in the Eocene. It contains abundant, excellently preserved mollusks. And these have attracted detailed systematic work since actually 1766. So we've got, um, you know, if you assemble the major uh, monographic works, you can basically fill up a couple of meters of bookshelf with them. And here are some nice illustrations from, I think about 1860, I think about Darwin's time and about 1900. Um, and using this great legacy, we can identify the taxa and easily infer their ecology. So, um, Specimens are easy to collect and prepare. You just simply uh, dig out big sacks of sand or mud, sieve them and uh, pull the shells out. And uh, one major issue, I guess, a major challenge is that one needs lots and lots of samples and tens of thousands of specimens to pull out general ecological signal. And that's because of the sheer diversity of mollusks and their wide compositional variance in um, between samples and among samples. So you do need a lot of them. Um, luckily, the NHM, Natural History Museum, holds many bulk sample collections made um, 90, from about the 1970s uh, onwards. And these were often made by, by amateurs, actually, and they're, they're an incredible resource. So here's our 34 sampled horizons in time, um, and they actually include PETM uh, sediments here. Um, so we've got good coverage over about 3 million years before the PT PETM and 3 million years after. At the moment, we're about 20,000 specimens, but we've got a lot more to still work on. Um, they comprise about 450 species. Um, and for those, we've also got an ecological trait database. But in um, the thing I'm just going to focus on uh, in this talk is actually salinity tolerance. I'm not going to discuss anything more. And I'm, I think the, the reason for that will become very clear. So what I'm now going to do is walk you through time showing the changing paleogeography of the North Sea Basin and its associated neuritic mollusk faunas. So what I've done is I've overlaid mollusk data on these great base maps by um, Knox et al of um, the North Sea Basin. And basically a quick guide here, gray is um, uh, basically land back in the Paleocene. Ye uh, pale yellow is uh, shallow shelf deposits. Orange represents brackish paralic deposits. Green and darker green are basinal sediments. On the right here, I'm showing um, a stratigraphic section of the UK uh, 
strata uh, with pie, simple pie charts here showing the composition of individual samples in terms of uh, uh, salinity of the contained mollusks. So basically whether they're marine in blue, white is brackish and pink fresh water. And these relate to these, these, uh, these strata. And on the map here, basically red, um, red arrows represent inferred dominant uh, current directions. And uh, yeah, so off we go. So in the late Paleocene, so this is two to two and a half million years before the PETN at 56.0 million years, um, we have an open Western approaches um, to the North Sea Basin here. Um, but we also have an uh, open uh, northern uh, portal here, and we have shallow marine de sands deposited in southern England, northern France, Belgium, uh, with dominantly cooler water mollusks, so northern mollusks, including things like, if you know your mollusks, Astarte and Arctica and Apiraeus and these sorts of things. Um, Now, in the latest Paleocene, and, and so we've jumped forward in time uh, to about 600,000 to uh, 1.2 million years before the PETM, everything's changed. Basically, the, um, the West approaches have opened and we've got a migration of shallow marine, uh, shallow marine taxa, uh, mollusks from the Atlantic, and you've got sands being deposited um, in this region with uh, a subtropical and tropical form and, um, and generally uh, few, rather few brackish taxa. So it's a fully marine um, subtropical fauna, which has migrated into the North Sea Basin. So let's move on again. Well, what happens at the PETM? Basically, you end up with land bridges here, Barents High and uh, um, the Western Approaches to the English Channel get, get cut off, and you end up with a semi-enclosed North Sea, which I'm proposing is sort of impounding a, a, a tropical fauna. Okay, through to the uh, PETM itself, again, paleo-oceanography. As Stephen showed with some incredible visuals, um, we, we know that, that Scotland here was uplifted by at least a kilometer during the PETM. And um, actually, the, the whole of the UK, or what is now the UA, UK, was, was, was kind of tilted. And you actually got uplift even in southern England as well, maybe I don't know, 100 metres, 50, 100 metres or whatever. And um, this resulted in uplift and closure of the Channel Seaway here. So you end up with basically this semi-enclosed North, North Sea. Um, and uh, there's increased precipitation in the PETM and the North here. You end up with a lot of runoff, um, turbiditic sands into the uh, into deep waters in the North Sea Basin, um, serve as uh, oil reservoirs, and these huge wedges of sediment over over um, Northwest Europe here, of uh, prograding into the basin, um, very organic rich sediments, and. In these sediments, you find a pectidinium, an acme in the abundance of this beast, which is a very good indicator for the PETM. And the PETM is very well represented in, in, in this region. If we look at the mollusks, well, uh, they're dominantly brackish throughout this time. Uh, they're brackish, there are marine components. Sometimes there's intercalations of fresh water, of fresh water taxa. But what we're looking at is, is, a, is a curious mixture. And it's been interpreted in two different ways. It's either, uh, it's typically interpreted as a mixture of brackish, reworked brackish taxa into a typical marine uh, milieu. So, so you end up with these uh, weird mixtures. But what I'd like to suggest, actually, 
is that we may be looking at a freshened margin of the North Sea with deposits that may not be, uh, sorry, faunas that may not be entirely analogous to uh, faunas at the present day. And um, these curious faunas actually extend into the earliest Eocene in places like um, Blackheath in southeast London. Um, and this, at this time, when we look out into the North Sea, we know that basically um, there was a, a, a stratified North Sea. You've got a, a huge amount of nutrients um, pouring off the land, and you've got repeated diatom and dinoflagellate blooms. So really rather nasty, anoxic bottom water, freshening of the surface, and these, these weird faunas in Northern Europe. If we go into the um, pretty much as soon as you get into the London clay here, um, sort of, I don't know, uh, half a million, million years, million and a half, two million years after the PETM, you, you end up with fully marine um, faunas, molluscan faunas, and these are, um, seem to have resulted from multiple phases of immigration of tropical marine taxa, probably through the Western approaches here. Um, and so you end up with these nice planktonic horizons and uh, pulses of, of fantastic marine um, tropical mollusks. Now, if we take the, uh, if we do an NMDS um, plot of uh, an ordination of the assemblage data of their taxa and abundance, one ends up with three groups here. Um, and these correspond with axes of, uh, they are arrayed over axes of increasing age here and decreasing salinity. And they actually correspond to first the marine Paleocene, this uh, weird mixed fauna, brackish and freshwater PETM, uh, followed by the marine Eocene. So in the North Sea, clearly there is a difference in faunas before and after the PETM. And that may be in contrast to the situation in the Gulf Coast of the US, but more work is needed, I think, and there is a big new data set for the US, which I think needs to be reanalyzed. At the PETM itself, we see these are basically ranged through plots, uh, time going up here, of black as marine taxa. We see that a bunch of marine taxa survive the PETM, this pink, orange uh, horizon here. They survive right, right the way through. And there's an origination of brackish tax, or the green tax are here at the PETM. Um, and maybe, you know, there was a survival of marine bivalves, uh, perhaps uh, actually in, in slightly hypersaline environments in the North Sea. Um, soon after the PETM, we have the Harwich formation. Um, now, some of these deposits have been collected for 150 years, so it's important to see whether these supposed uh, originations and extinctions are real. And looking at um, taxonomic monographs and so on, it does appear that these that this, this big wedge of originations and actually followed soon after by extinctions does appear to be real. And uh, maybe these are recovery taxa, maybe there's something actually more interesting going on here. Uh, but no time to talk about that at the moment. So for the North Sea, um, some conclusions. Um, there were weird bra brackish marine PETM faunas and uh, more work on taphonomy and geochemistry and paleoecology is required on these. Um, the North Sea itself may have been a possible refuge for Uri haline mollusks. However, it, it seems very clear that other refuges must have existed in the North Atlantic. Um, the tropical mollusks of the London clay have to have migrated from somewhere. Um, and so we should be careful not to generalize the disoxic conditions of the US Western Atlantic seaboard all across the North Atlantic. Otherwise, it's very difficult to see where these beasts actually emerged from and migrated from. Um, I think, uh, Really, to go further with this, we need uh, detailed phylogenetic and biogeographic study of, of paleogene mollusks in the North Atlantic, and that data is basically lacking. Um, the, uh, 
the benthic mollusk response, as I've shown in the, uh, in the North, North Sea, was ultimately the result of the tight interaction of, of, of climate, um, tectonics, and oceanography. It's not just a simple um, warming event. And um, finally, uh, yeah. So also, I, I've mentioned these uh, faunas are non seem to be non-analogous to extant marine faunas, but again, more work's required there. Um, and finally, it seems that you know the macro, the coastal marine faunal response to the PETM is dependent on starting conditions. So in the North Sea, I'm proposing that a tropical fauna got impounded. And that was a fauna that was pre-adapted to um, greenhouse conditions. So it's a very hot ocean um, compared to what we used to. Um, but the results might have been rather different if maybe it was more temperate fauna um, in, in the North Sea then. And there may well have been a lot more extinction. And so uh, a take home message might be that uh, to predict the response of extant shelf marine faunas to global warming, we've got to study them at a, a, a regional level rather than making overly uh, wide um, extrapolations from global data. And so moving on to the Darwin uh, postscript here, this is the, I didn't really know where else to put it, but uh, I think this is appropriate. As all the living forms of life are the lineal descendants of those which lived long before the Silurian epoch, we may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken, and that no cataclysm, not even the PETM, has desolated the whole world. Finally, I'd like to thank some colleagues at the Natural History Museum and Jackie Skipper for helping generate this data. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we are slightly behind, well, a bit behind time here, but there is one question in the chat. So if we deal with that, and then I think Tracy will agree to a five minute break. Is that fair? Uh, comfort break for people. So there's a, the question here from uh, Matthew Status is, in terms of unique brackish marine PETM faunas, do you think this is a response to an increased hydrological cycle as seen in the Arctic at this time, or do you, to the restriction of the North Sea due to uplift? Um, both. <laughs> I think these were, I, I really don't know. I'm not a climatologist. I imagine these things uh, would be reinforcing each other, um, leading to this freshening uh, North Sea. Um, I think that that signal has been known for a long time from the, uh, the basinal um, uh, microfossil record, but it hasn't been linked to these weird mollusk faunas, um, which I think have been usually just interpreted as like back barrier lagoonal faunas um, in Northern Europe. And I think it might be more interesting than that. I think we might actually be looking at rather weird marine faunas instead. So um, yeah, I think that's the best I can do with trying to answer that. Okay. Good. Well, as I say, in the interest of time, we must move on. Um, so shall we say we'll come back at 1438 military time uh, and we start to set, I'll hand over to Tracy then. OK. Right. One percent in some areas. Now, it, the reefs that Darwin studied probably had 70 percent living coral or more in some cases. And yet this graph only maxes out at 50%. And I think it would have been hard for Darwin to predict that 180 years uh, after his publication, that the situation with reefs uh, would be as it is documented below. Now, reefs have been declining for a long time, certainly as long as I have been studying them, <laughs> sadly. And you see on the left, a picture I took in 1975 as a graduate student a long, long time ago uh, from the north coast of Jamaica. And, and those reefs uh, at the time, uh, those of us who were there studying them, took them for granted. Uh, they looked pretty healthy, lots of live coral. You see all these little branches and heads and whatever, that's all living coral. Uh, but what was not in, in this picture, and which we didn't recognize the significance uh, of, was the absence of any 
uh, large fish, certainly. So there are a couple of small plankton eating fish up here in the upper right hand picture. I didn't take this picture to illustrate the absence of fish, but in looking back at it now, um, uh, it's it's pretty clear that there and and we did discuss the absence of fishes. This we didn't make any kind of connection between the absence of large fish and the health of the reefs themselves. And unfortunately, nature made that clear to us uh, uh, through a series of events, uh, which I could perhaps describe in greater detail if somebody asked me in the question period. But by 1985, 10 years later, those coral reefs were gone as coral reefs, and they uh, almost all the bottom was then covered with. Um, macroalgae, as you see here on the right. Now, the, that was uh, between 1975 and 1985. And since then, the pace of change has, has just been accelerating into what I would have to describe as a global coral reef phase shift. So you see on this it, two images here, both um, from 2013. Uh, two places I visited. And on the left is from the southern line islands of the Kiribati Republic. Um, and, um, and you can see in 2013, uh, a huge amount of uh, living coral and healthy fish populations. But I also went <clears throat> to the Philippines that same year. And that unfortunately is a more typical picture of what reefs have become uh, devoid of almost all living coral. The little bits of white that you see there in those images are actually a coral that is uh, bleaching from water that's too warm. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And uh, and around the world, we've seen these transitions. And even the Southern Line Islands, as healthy as they were in 2013, were severely affected by uh, extreme warm water um, uh, a few years later. Now, not only are they transitioning from um, from reefs covered by living coral to reefs largely lacking living coral. They're even physically vanishing altogether. And this was uh, first noted um, by in a paper by Lewis on the reefs of Barbados, where he used aerial photographs to show that the, the, the structure of the reefs themselves was eroding. And that's because, of course, if uh, reefs are a living dynamic entity, um, and they're constantly being grown by the actions of corals, but they're also constantly being eroded by fish chewing at them and sponges dissolving them and urchins gnawing on them. And so if you have very little coral growth and those processes of destruction are continuing, essentially you wind up with a gradual elimination of the physical structure itself. And you can see that in that image, the shrinkage um, in these reefs in Barbados. Uh, but even more dramatically, as a recent study showing uh, that many of the reefs that are in uh, the original uh, nautical charts uh, from 240 years ago uh, from Florida are actually not there now physically. There's no trace of them. About 52% of the reefs in the Florida Keys have actually vanished so that you can't even, things that were in nautical charts from 240 years ago are, are no longer present. So that's a pretty uh, tr uh, dramatic change in the state of affairs for reefs. So, so why is this happening? Um, now, we've talked a lot about the fossil record. This goes back a little bit farther than we've been discussing. Uh, nice review by uh, Kiesling, who, who showed very clearly that reefs have not always been with us through uh, time. They come and go, and the red portions of this graph are actually the reefs built by corals. Uh, so they come and they go, but uh, what's happening now is that essentially people are changing the rules of the game in ways that make it much less able, uh, make it much harder for corals to uh, deposit skeletons uh, and uh, at a, a sufficient rate for reefs to be maintained. And uh, so I'd like to say a few words about what those processes are. Um, so for example, hurricane damage is normal uh, for coral reefs. And you see that in terms of the, the path, the records of past hurricanes over the last 150 years or so um, in that upper central diagram. Quite a few, apart from that thin band um, uh, near the equator, um, most coral reefs um, are regularly experience hurricane damage, essentially all the reefs of the Caribbean, uh, the reefs of uh, the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, many of the reefs of the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean as well. Uh, but the problem is that hurricane 
uh, are becoming uh, more powerful as a function of climate change. Now, I was actually in a very powerful hurricane, Hurricane Allen, 1980. Uh, there you see the picture that I took from the refuge uh, where we were all staying during the hurricane when we woke up the next morning. And those large waves um, can be scaled by the trees, which are about uh, on the point, uh, which are about uh, 10 meters high. And this hurricane uh, actually still holds one record in terms of intensity uh, from 1980, but by and large, the record, the intensity records are being broken over and over and over again as a function of uh, climate change. Similarly, sedimentation is normal, and uh, corals really don't like having sediments dumped on them. And if there's enough of enough sedimentation uh, you can get smothered and die. But uh, climate change is again increasing the frequency of uh, downpours. And then in addition to climate change, deforestation uh, is worsening the effects of those downpours. So you see uh, water uh, filled with sediments running onto coastal uh, reefs and the result is a lot of coral death. Again, competition is a normal part of coral reefs. In fact, uh, when you have a healthy coral reef, there's very little in the way of vacant real estate. But overfishing and nutrient pollutions are giving seaweeds the upper hand in their competition with corals. So you see on the left, two corals competing with each other. It's actually an experiment that we ran to show which species of coral was dominant. And the coral on the left has eaten away the tissues of the coral on the right. That's what you see, that white space. But on the, on the right-hand image, you see uh, what is normally very rapidly and clean, uh, rapidly growing and clean uh, branches of staghorn coral being smothered by uh, seaweeds. And um, overfishing re uh, takes out the fish that normally eat seaweeds and nutrient pollution causes the seaweeds to grow faster. So between the two, um, the, com the competitive balance is definitely shifting away from a coral advantage and towards a seaweed advantage. Again, predation is a normal part of coral reefs. Uh, but again, as with a competition, overfishing and pollution is making predator uh, plagues are making predator plagues more common. You see here an image uh, from the Great Barrier Reef uh, of a coral that's being eaten by these very large uh, Cranothorn starfish, which you see here. Um, there are three that you can see right in the foreground, but they're they're all over this reef. And these, these are very large for scale. They can be easily a meter in diameter. And th there are other predator plagues uh, that have also uh, occurred as a function of uh, these two changes to the conditions. Uh, overfishing again removes the predators of these coral eating organisms and pollution increases their probability of surviving through the larval, larval stage uh, by having the water be more uh, full of potential food items. Um, some disease is normal, uh, just as it is in, in any population, but warming, pollution, and, and actually unknown factors are leading to catastrophic epidemics. The most recent being uh, the uh, tissue wasting disease in the Caribbean, which is uh, bringing some species of Caribbean corals really to the brink of extinction with mortality rates of uh, upwards of 80%. And it spread, it started in Florida, but it spread throughout the Caribbean, as you see on that map on the right. And, uh, and some corals uh, could conceivably be uh, actually uh, caused to go extinct as a function of this uh, disease, much as some frog species have been ca caused to go extinct uh, by the disease that afflicts them. And then bleaching uh, is, an, is a normal stress response. Now, bleaching occurs when uh, the symbiotic uh, dinoflagellates that live inside the tissue of corals um, are damaged by water that's uh, too warm. They also, but it's a it's a normal stress response. So it can the, the symbiotic relationship between the corals and the symbiotic um, dinoflagellates can be disrupted by uh, darkness. It can be disrupted by cold water as well. Um, but what's happening now are these series of heat waves increasing in strength and also increasing in frequency. The most striking of which occurred. Uh, globally, but particularly well documented for the Great Barrier Reef between 2016 and 2017, when a third or more of the corals in the Great Barrier Reef uh, died as a result. So this is, as I say, bleaching is a normal stress response in the sense that uh, when when the symbionts are not performing well, it's in the corals' interest to expel them from the tissues. But mass mortality as a function of stress is certainly not normal. And this is clearly a direct 
um, signature of climate, the effect of climate change on coral reefs and is now really viewed as the, the biggest threat to the long-term persistence of reefs uh, around the world. And of course, there's some things that aren't really normal at all, at least in the recent uh, history of reefs and in some cases at all. So we have invasive species being moved around. Uh, on the left, you see a lionfish introduced to the Caribbean from the Indo-West Pacific, which uh, gobbles up lots of baby fish, making the overfishing problem even worse. You have dynamite fishing, obviously uh, not something that corals, uh, coral reefs are uh, uh, used to. And then ocean acidification. We've heard a lot about ocean acidification in the context of the, um, the, the uh, PETM, but this level of ocean acidification is not something that corals, at least for quite a long time, have been um, subjected to. And it has effects on when the coral, when the water is, uh, becomes more acidic, um, it makes it harder for the corals to secrete their skeletons. And you particularly can see the effect on the, on the baby corals, which have very thin skeletons, which you see here under different condition, pH conditions with uh, really high levels of um, acidification leading to the dissolution of the skeletons of the, of the settling corals. And so now I'd like to turn for the rest of this talk as to what we should do. Now, for years, I would just, um, give talks that uh, were all about the problems. And I, each of these things that I mentioned in one slide could be expanded into several slides and I could easily take up 30 minutes or more uh, talking about all the problems. But one of the things that I've um, come to realize in my sort of public outreach about the state of coral reefs, or for that matter, the state of the planet, is that if you just um, talk about the problems and you don't talk about what the solutions might be, um, in the end, uh, we're not really moving forward because we want coral reefs to survive. And if all we talk about the problems, uh, it's like, it's actually, you even risk people becoming, instead of motivated to do something, um, uh, made apathetic and with just because there's, it seems like there's nothing that can be done. So if there's nothing to, that you can do, and, and some, many people would prefer just not to worry about it. So, um, so there's been a real move in, in marine conservation and generally in coral reef conservation to start thinking about what the solutions might be. And this is a recent analysis that I and others prepared for policymakers. And it, 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 it basically suggests that we have three primary pillars that we can work with to uh, increase the health and resilience of uh, coral reefs around the world. The first um, is uh, to reduce uh, global climate change threats. And this goes without saying, I'm not going to dwell on it. It's not just coral reefs, of course, that are dependent upon our addressing climate change. On the left, you see my house. This is where I'm uh, calling in from right now um, with my solar panels, my electric car. But what's really important is the massive deployment of um, uh, renewable energy sources around the world, which is really starting to take off. And also the increasing electrification of uh, many of our um, the components of our daily life, including vehicles. Um, certainly, Norway has led the way uh, in this, but it's the the pace of uh, electrification is really starting to pick up. Not fast enough, and as I say, that could be a whole a talk in and of itself. But uh, it is an absolute essential component of what uh, we need to do. But in addition to reducing global climate change, which is not something that can be done instantly, in part because some of the changes actually baked into the system by the emissions that have already occurred. What else is there that we can do to help uh, uh, prevent coral reefs from uh, disappearing around the world? Well, the, the second pillar is to improve local conditions. And one of the best ways of um, knowing what that means in detail is to learn from the bright spots. That is the places where coral reefs have not uh, gone uh, terribly down in terms of their health. And this is a, uh, an analysis from a, a paper written um, by uh, Jeremy Jackson, my husband, as John mentioned, uh, and analyzing the state of coral reefs in the Caribbean. And what he sh showed in this is that there were basically three different trajectories. If you looked at reefs from 1969 to 2011, which is what the study covered. And in some cases you had this dramatic drop. In some cases you had a steady drop, but there are some reefs uh, where their drop basically hadn't occurred and, and the level, the percent of living corals, although not as high as it was before humans had an impact, was basically holding steady at 
uh, at higher levels than uh, was characteristic of most reefs. And one really good example of that are the reefs of Bonaire in the Southern Caribbean. And these have been uh, extensively studied by Bob Stanek. You see here a picture on the left, a lot of uh, living coral and healthy fish communities. And on the right, you see this quantified with uh, the amount of seaweeds on the horizontal axis and the amount of corals on the vertical axis. And you can see in the Caribbean has moved from uh, between uh, 1970 to the present, the Caribbean has moved in general from a position of having high coral cover and low macroalgae cover to a position of having much more macroalgae and much less coral. But here's Bonaire up here, a real exception to the general trend. And so, you know, what has Bonaire done? Uh, it's done a lot. And I think it uh, shows the benefits that uh, can accrue to countries and regions uh, where they take the threats of uh, coral reef decline seriously. Bonaire, of course, is highly dependent on tourism and the reefs and much of that tourism is associated with diving and snorkeling. And so this, uh, the loss of reefs represented a severe economic threat to the, uh, to the, to Bonaire. And so back in 1971, they banned spearfishing. Uh, 1975, they banned the harvest of live coral. 1979, they established uh, the National Park, which covers all the waters of Bonaire. Um, and then in 1992, they set up this tag system, which you see on the left, where you actually have to pay a very modest amount of money to go snorkeling or diving on the reefs. Um, and then no fishing areas were established within the uh, park in 2008. And then in 2010, they banned fishing for parrotfish and got rid of fish traps. So that's really important because parrotfish are the primary consumers of seaweed uh, in uh, the Caribbean. And so making sure that their populations are healthy is really important. And so the result has been a real improvement in the health of the coral reefs of Bonaire is measured by the, what I would call, what you could call their resilience. So Bonaire is not immune to some of these global things that happened. In particular, there was a hurricane in 2008 and a big bleaching event caused by hot water uh, in 2010. And uh, in terms of seaweeds, what happened? So here's the hurricane and here's the bleaching. So after those two disturbances, coral the seaweeds went way up. But since then, they've been declining. And similarly. Uh, in the case of the corals, here's the hurricane and the bleaching, coral cover dropped, but has since been increasing. So that's a measure of Bonaire's resilience. That is a reef that has been protected from other aspects of human impacts is more likely to be able to recover when something bad happens uh, that is sort of outside the, the ability of local management to affect, which is certainly the case for hurricanes and, and heat waves. But it's also been recently discovered that uh, healthy reefs even improve the resistance to stress, not the ability to bounce back, but, but the, it makes, them, makes some reefs less likely to undergo mass bleaching and mortality altogether. And this is a recent paper by Mary Donovan and colleagues in Science. And what they showed was that um, the more, uh, this is the percent uh, change in coral cover over the year following the bleaching event. So it's basically the amount of death that occurred from the bleaching event itself as a function of the amount of seaweed on the bottom. And what you can see is that, um, uh, and is that um, the more, more seaweed there are, the greater the decline. So this is decline and this is increase in the, uh, in the coral cover. And the, the effect is actually strongest when the when the heat stress is the highest, so the orange are higher heat less, higher stress, higher stress events in terms of temperature than the blue. So that is really a good news uh, because for a long time it was thought that while healthy, improving local conditions would allow coral reefs to bounce back, there was no evidence that would actually improve their ability to survive the, the heat disturbance itself. And then fi finally, the third pillar is to invest in active restoration uh, because so many when, when you have a situation like I uh, described at the beginning of this talk with so many reefs in such really bad shape uh, you can't simply wait for things to get better you really have to help reefs along so some of this uh, can be relatively um, relatively low tech. This is work done to restore reefs after blast fishing in Indonesia. Uh, what happens when you uh, explode um, 
a dynamite on a coral reef that's used to help harvest the fish, but it breaks all the corals into little tiny fragments and that leads to a very unstable bottom and it's very hard for the corals to grow back because everything keeps moving around with the waves. So, but if you stabilize the, the bottom and various different treatments were shown here, you can see, so if this is the, on the left, you see what happens if nothing is done in terms of the recovery of hard coral cover. And you can see a variety of different uh, alternative treatments resulted in dramatic increases uh, in coral cover uh, over um, about a uh, about a 12 year period. There are also interesting uh, finance novel finance mechanisms being used uh, to uh, pay for restoration. This is a insurance scheme uh, where coral reefs are insured from hurricane hurricane damage, and when a hurricane occurs, the payout from the insurance uh, covers the cost of having local people. Uh, repair the damage. And, and interestingly, restoration on land can also be very beneficial to coral reefs. This was shown by Nick Graham on, uh, by comparing uh, islands with and without rats in the Indian Ocean. And what he found was that uh, because rats uh, kill seabirds, the islands had many, with rats had many fewer seabirds. That meant there were fewer on uh, nutrient subsidies to the reefs around the islands and that resulted in uh, uh, less grazing um, by the fish that eat seaweeds and so he found that the reefs in general without rats uh, on the on the land part of the island were actually underwater the reefs the corals themselves were healthier and so this has led to efforts to uh, restore natural vegetation get rid of rats and uh, and also restore seabirds in places like Palmara atoll which you see on the left hand side and then finally, I'd like to loop back to Darwin and uh, talk about some Darwin, uh, uh, some things that Darwin, I'm sure, never imagined uh, called Darwin on steroids, uh, which has been um, uh, sometimes described as assisted evolution, that is human assisted evolution. A couple of years ago, the National, uh, the, Nas uh, the National Academy of Science produced a consensus report, which I was part of, looking for ways to scale up the effectiveness of restoration. And one of the, uh, there are a number of different things that were uh, suggested and analyzed in terms of their benefits and their potential risks. It's also, it's very important to look at the risks as well as the benefits. And they included things like um, uh, various breeding programs and moving, uh, reefs from uh, corals from places where the water is normally hot to uh, to places where the water is getting hotter to see if it could improve the res uh, the ability of the corals locally to um, uh, resist heat waves but perhaps the most interesting and most scary is what uh, is going on now in a number of labs uh, that is coral genome editing using CRISPR techniques and it's been already been shown that it's possible uh, to change the heat tolerance of coral through CRISPR gene editing. So it's kind of a brave new world out there for corals. Um, I don't know exactly what Darwin would think of it, but uh, with that, I'll finish my talk and take any questions. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, um, i just really like to thank you for, um, you know, fantastic uh, talk there with some really important and, and powerful messages. Um, thank you so much. Um, we've got time to take a few questions. So um, you can either, you know, stick your hand up if you want to give a talk, uh, uh, ask a question or um, write it in the chat. Mark. What role do you think there is for biobanking in, in saving and preserving corals? I'm sorry, could you repeat? I missed one word. What the role of what? Biobanking. Oh, biobanking. Actually, that's I didn't mention that, but biobanking is occurring uh, right now. There's uh, Mary Hagedorn, who's actually associated with the Smithsonian, and colleagues in Australia are collecting gametes um, and um, uh, freezing them and have actually sh used, in some cases, uh, frozen sperm from uh, corals that uh, came from one part of the Caribbean uh, to fertilize coral eggs from another part. So biobanking and actually they, it's not, I mean, I would describe biobanking as kind of, you know, plan A, plan B, kind of plan D for total disaster. Uh, like uh, having a freezer full of gametes is uh, 
better than not having a freezer full of gametes. But what's I think more interesting is the use of biobank material to um, facilitate selective breeding uh, uh, to uh, improve the ability of corals to resist uh, warm temperatures. Uh, because corals, many corals only breed for a couple nights once a year. And so it's not like you can just bring them into the lab and, and, and breed them the way people have traditionally bred, say, dogs or cattle or, or plants. Uh, and so having these biobank gametes is very helpful for that. Thanks for that question. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, David, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I, I found that fascinating. Um, I do a lot of work uh, on Cousin Island in the Indian Ocean. And I saw the bleaching in 97, 96, 97 actually happen. And uh, I guess my question is, from the data you were showing, are you suggesting then that these reefs were already seriously stressed or seriously knocked out of balance? And that's why the bleaching occurred. So under a normal conditions with healthy reefs, we wouldn't get that bleaching. No, I wouldn't. Unfortunately, I would not say that. Um, and in fact, one of the notable things about the bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef, which was really well documented um, by Terry Hughes and colleagues um, at uh, uh, James Cook University and other uh, locations, is that much of the most severe bleaching took place um, in uh, northern, more remote parts of the Great Barrier Reef, which are pretty far away from human impact. So I think it, these, um, that resu those results of Mary Donovan weren't to say that everything would be fine if we had a healthy reef. Some really, when you have a really um, extreme heat wave, it's going to cause bleaching. It's just that it might cause less death uh in the healthiest of, of reefs and there are certain situations i mean the situation in australia during that mass bleaching was so severe that essentially that they weren't even going through the normal uh, when corals are bleached they're actually still alive normally they just don't have their symbionts in their tissues but if you look cl closely the reason they look white is because the the symbionts are gone, so the pigments are gone, so you can see right through the tissues into the skeleton. That's why they look white, but they still have a living cover of tissue. But in the case of the bleaching in Australia, in many cases, the, the corals were actually just, the water was so hot that they were actually just cooking in place and dying immediately. Because it is possible for sort of strongly bleached but still living corals to recover when temperatures go back to normal. But that was not the case in, in a lot of situations. So no, you can't all of these are, that's why I think the first pillar is so important. We have to do something about climate change. But in the meantime, there are things we can do to slow down the death and destruction, which is really what we're trying to do because if we can, it, it, we're kind of in a race uh, with climate change, trying to implement these mechanisms to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And in the meantime, keep as much of the biosphere in a you know quasi decent condition while we, deal with the the root source of the problem so it buys time and it helps but it's not a complete solution which is why pillar one of reducing climate change itself is so important thank you that's really um thank you very much for the question david um i i uh, there are lots of questions that i have <laughs> i want to ask you um but I think probably in the interest of time, and we'll leave it there, and perhaps we'll we'll um, you know come back to some of them later if we have a, a bit of time. Um, but I just would really like to thank um, and Nancy for a, a fantastic talk and really um, powerful and thought provoking. And um, yeah, you know, um, much much appreciated. Thank you very much indeed. Perfect. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Brilliant. Um, okay, look, I'm going to um, just introduce our final speaker of the day, Ali uh, Fillimore. So if you can, um, if you can have a go at sharing your screen, I'll just say a couple of words of introduction. Um, and while you get that up. Okay, great. Um, so our final speaker is Ali uh, Fillimore, who's a Chancellor's Fellow um, um, in the School of Biological Sciences at University of Edinburgh. Um, Ali is um, a, a leading um, evolutionary ecologist. Um, who studies impacts of global change on species interactions and fitness. And he's, he's specifically interested in how um, the timing of these key life history um, events can have major effects on fitness. And, and given that 
you know, all of the projections and the evidence show that that phenology um, will advance. Um, you know, this kind of work, I think, is crucial to understand what the con consequences of that will be for most species. Um, so it's a great pleasure to welcome Ali and to invite him to give his talk, Timing It Right in a Claim Changing Climate. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction and uh, thanks for staying around, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today, then, is phenology. And I'm sure you all know a bit about phenology, the timing of recurrent life history events. This can be the flowering times of plants, um, flight times of butterflies, breeding times of birds or, or frogs, and many of these different kinds of spring events. And phenology seems kind of a really interesting area in terms of capturing the imagination of amateur naturalists and sits and scientists, and also increasingly capturing the imagination of evolutionary biologists and ecologists. And I want to explore a little bit why um, evolutionary biologists and ecologists have become so interested in phenology. So as we'll see in a few slides of my talk, and as we, you all know, spring phenology is very strongly affected by spring temperatures, warmer temperatures and earlier timings at high latitudes. But phenology also is very important in determining the abiotic conditions an organism is exposed to. So imagine a frog that spawns too early and might have its spawn uh, exposed to late frosts. And it's also very important in determining the interactions that are av available with the same and with other species. So opportunities for mating or interactions with competitors or availability of resources. So because of phenology actually mattering for abiotic conditions and biotic um, interactions, and it's expected to have a really pronounced impact on reproduction and survival, or in kind of Darwinian terms, the struggle for existence. And so for an ecologist and evolutionary biologist, because spring, is, spring temperatures are expected to affect phenology and phenology is expected to matter for fitness, then this is a particularly interesting place for us to look for impacts. Now I'd like to give a, kind of a little bit of a historical context to phenology. Um, where we can see where Darwin fits into it. So if we go back to right back to 1736, and Robert Marsham, very local to Norwich, so he's on the Stratton Strawless estate, just 10 miles north of uh, Norwich, he started collecting observations of 27 different indications of springs, so things like the first swallow and the first oak in leaf and so on. And he continued collecting these observations throughout his life. And then towards the end of his life, he reported them to the Royal Society. And then the miraculous thing is his descendants continued collecting these records right the way through until the 1940s. And then a bit later, from about the 1880s through till the 1940s, the Royal Meteorological Society produced an annual phenological report where people submitted phenological observations from across the UK. So this must be a very early case of citizen science ecology. And you can see these beautiful kind of isocare maps of equal phenology across the UK. And then unfortunately, in the 1940s, Really, it was persuade, people were persuaded that phenology was just the preserve of the amateur naturalist. So they stopped recording. And we can see where Darwin fits in this. He actually doesn't say an awful lot about phenology. I found a quote from his Voyage of the Beagle, where he's in Patagonia and he says, on the 15th of September, a few animals began to appear. And by the 18th, everything announced the commencement of spring. The plains were ornamented by the flowers of a pink wood sorrel, wild peas, inothera, and geraniums and the birds began to lay their eggs. And what follows in this kind of, uh, what follows this quote, he then goes on to explain that it's all driven by the rising temperatures that were in the preceding days. So Darwin had a very clear understanding of what was driving phenology. So let's bring kind of phenology research forward here. We have the, the famous climate stripes. And from about the 1940s, the British Trust for Ornithology were collating people's observations of nest records. So this is where really avid ornithologists go and either find nests or use nest boxes and submit observations of when birds were first laying their eggs. And then more recently, there's been other citizen scientists such as the very successful Nature's Calendar in the UK, which started in 1998, and they now have many millions of observations of the first spawning dates of frogs, the first leafing dates of oaks, first swallow and so on. So I'll be coming back to the value of some of these citizen science data later in the talk. One of the nice things actually with Nature's Calendar is they have a, a really good website that allows you to visualize 
how phonology is changing through the UK by sliding this bar at the bottom. So you can see you know, the gradual spread of frog spawning through the UK, for instance. So some of our, um, my own group's work looking at the effects of spring temperatures on phonology from these citizen science data sets shows really quite pronounced shifts. So for the first leafing dates of many tree species in the UK, with nature's calendar data, we find there's around about a one week advance if the year is one degree warmer. For the flowering times of plants such as cuckoo flower, garlic mustard, we find about a six days advance per degree. For butterfly flight times, for the univoltine species, we find around about six days advance per degree. And for birds, these are for mainly whole nesting birds with BTO data, we find around about four days advance per degree. So the main question I'm kind of exploring in this talk today is, are populations able to get timings right in a changing climate? And there's three parts of the question I'm going to explore. The first is, how much phen phenological plasticity is there? By which I mean, how much are individuals able to just adjust their timing from year to year? The second one we'll look at is, how much is the optimum timing shifting? And by kind of putting the first two parts together, we can ask, well, how much shortfall is there and how much will populations need to evolve to keep up and are they able to? And we'll see there's been quite a, a kind of different amounts of progress on these different questions. So Darwin also had something to, up, something to say on phenotypic plasticity. He says, when variation is of the slightest use to any being, we cannot tell how much to attribute to the cumulative action of natural selection and how much to the definite action of the conditions of life. So this is from the or origin. And he goes on to talk about the fact that as you go to colder environments, you get thicker and thicker fur. Now, of course, we now think of plasticity as a, it itself is very potentially adaptive, and that's something I'll talk about in, a, in relation to phenology. So how much phenological plasticity is there? Well, the, I'm going to show you a few slides based on a kind of very quick analysis of data we've collected ourselves. We've got this, this transect through Scotland, though, where we monitor um, phenology of trees, caterpillars, and birds at 44 sites. And what I've done here is I've taken a single oak tree and its first leafing dates in different years. And we can see that the difference between the earliest year and the latest year is over two weeks. So this is an individual having a pronounced variation of when it comes into leaf. And then we can plot the timing of that single oak tree's leafing in relation to the March-April average temperature at that site in, in, in each year. And you can see, although I haven't paid a regression line to these very few data points, you can see a pronounced um, negative trend. And I think the slope of that's around about a seven days advance per degree. So really pronounced plasticity from the oak trees. And we can also do similar types of analysis for the blue tits. So we can go to individual blue tits that we've ringed on the nest and find the few lucky individuals that survive more than one or two seasons and see how their timing varies. So this is one individual female, Z632398, and the timing of its egg laying in different years. And what I've done in the next slide is I've looked at all the individuals that survived for more, more than three years, how much the, the temperature that they experienced deviated in each year, how much their egg laying deviated in each year. And from that, we can estimate an overall kind of average plasticity of these birds. And you can see that individual birds lay their eggs earlier in a warmer year. So this was a, a very quick analysis um, from White and Woods, people like Ben Sheldon have much, much better analyses that show that um, great tits have around about four days per degree plasticity. So the conclusion of this first part of the talk is that when we look for evidence of phenological plasticity, we actually find quite a lot of it. So the next question is, how much is the optimum timing shifting? And this proves to be a much harder nut to crack. Now, if we want to identify how the optimum is, sh is shifting, we first need to estimate the optimum timing in an individual year. So we need observations of many individuals with different timings, and we need to quantify their fitness. And if we do that, then we can fit a curve through it, and we can estimate when the optimum timing is. But that's just for one single year. And if we want to ask how the optimum timing is shifting, we need to do that for many different years and then estimate how those optimum timings are shifting either in relation to year 
or in relation to temperature. So you can see that the data required for this requires very long-term studies, but also a great amount of detail to them as well. And as a consequence, we've had very few estimates of this. I'm just gonna give you an example of um, the two that I know of. So this is a study of great tits um, studied in the Netherlands from 1973 to 2013, although their study is ongoing. So this is the famous Hogevaloo population. And they applied an approach very much like what I described to these whole nesting birds. And they found that the optimum laying date advanced by about five days for every one degree warmer the spring was. So quite similar to what we've seen the estimates of plasticity are for species like this. And here's another study of dippers on rivers in southern Norway. Again, a long-term study from 1979 to 2013. And they found that the optimum lay date was advancing by one day per year. So from these two studies, we've got some evidence that the optimum timing is getting earlier and is advancing with warming. But we're, we're really a long way from getting these types of estimates for many species. It's just too much work involved um, to do these long-term studies. And so this got myself and colleagues thinking about whether there's other ways we could try and make similar inferences. Now we know temperature varies a lot from year to year, but it also varies a lot geographically. So in the UK, much warmer in the south than in the north. And so what we've been exploring is whether you can do a kind of space for time substitution, but where you use the spatial phenotypic response to temperature to inform us about kind of long-term or equilibrium responses. So potentially even optimum responses. So I'll just take you through a method that I developed along with Jared Hadfield and Owen Jones, where we can try and detect local adaptation from citizen science data. And as I've said, there's this abundantly available citizen science data collected for many locations and many years. So imagine that, um, imagine we've looked at a single population in different years. We know what the temperature cue is. We know what the phenology is and we can do a regression to see how does phenology change as temperature changes. And so that should be due to plasticity and potentially a contribution of, of adaptation. But if we're looking at kind of a fluctuating temperature change and a short time period, then perhaps adaptations a very small contribution. Now imagine we're looking at a relationship between temperature and phenology over many different sites, many different populations. So that relationship should be due to plasticity plus the contribution of local adaptation. And so this is where the kind of equilibrium assumption about the spatial relationship comes in. Now, if we assume the plasticity is a constant, the difference between those two slopes gives us an estimate of local adaptation. So our first test case for this method was frog spawning um, based on tens of thousands of observation of first spawning dates in the UK. And we, in this first, um, this first model, we found that January temperature was the best predictor of spawning date. So each one of these lines here on the left shown, shows a, the average slope across time, um, across different years, sorry, for, um, for different populations that we've subdivided in the UK. So we find that the frogs spawn around about three days earlier for every one degree the year's warmer. If instead we look at the average spawning date and the average um, temperature in different grid cells, we get this spatial relationship, which is much, much steeper. So about minus 13 days per degree C. And so from that, we made the inference that the plasticity was minus three days per degree C and the local adaptation, the difference between these two slopes um, was significant. Now we can take these slopes and multiply it with predicted changes in UK temperature. So this was from an old projection of UK temperature increase for 2050, um, projecting 2.8 degrees in the south east and about 1.6 degrees in the north of Scotland. So we can multiply this temperature increase by the, the plastic slope to see how much we think the frogs should advance via plasticity. And we can also multiply this spatial slope to see how much they need to advance to stay as adapted as they currently are. So how, how much do they need to adapt to stay equilibrium? And we can see that's a much more, um, it's a much larger advance they'd need. So they need about 37 days in the south of England. Um, so there's a huge 
kind of shortfall between how much they'll shift their timing via plasticity and how much they might need to shift. So we've taken this method, we developed a little bit further and we've applied it to um, the egg laying dates of these four bird species, so blue tit, great tit, chaffinch and pied flycatcher. You can see re very pronounced gradients across the UK and when they lay their eggs, both latitudinal and longitudinal. And you can see that all four species have advanced their egg laying date over the, the time period we were looking at. So I think for great tits, that would, would advance by around about somewhere between 10, 10 days and two weeks. So I won't go into the, the underlying kind of methods and assumptions for this, but using a method that Jared developed, Jared Hadfield, um, we were able to estimate how much the optimum timing was shifting for these birds. And we find that for every one degree warmer, all four of these bird species were shifting their egg, the optimum egg laying date should shift by about four days. So the question is, how well can plasticity track that? Well, here is our estimates of plasticity for the same species. What we can see is the estimates of plasticity are remarkably similar to the estimates of the optimum, the shift in the optimum. So we inferred that plasticity and laden date was very similar to the optimum slope. And that means that plasticity is itself very adaptive. And there's one exception that I'll come back to, and that's the, the pied flycatcher. Here you can see the optimum is shifting by about four days per degree, but the plasticity looks a bit shallower. So this brings us to the, the final question I had then is, will populations need to evolve to keep up and are they able to? So we'll look at kind of how much is the optimum shifting and how much, how steep is the plastic response and kind of track the optimum. So here we have a relationship between temperature and phenology, the optimum relationship. And you might find a, a, a bit faint and blue below, that's the, the plastic response. And that would be a case where plasticity tracks the optimum timing. And I'd say that some of the species we're looking at, things like the blue tit, the great tit and the chaffinch seem to really to fit with that scenario. The other, another scenario is where the optimum relationship is steeper than the plastic response. And as we get to warmer and warmer temperatures, there's a short, there's a kind of a, a lag that's gonna to need to be made up. So these are the situations where we might, kind of the populations might be kind of lagging behind climate change and where adaptation might be required. And so that, a case where that might, where that may exist would be the hide flycatcher that I already mentioned. Well, a recent review, well actually it's no longer recent, it's 2012, but I think it, the statement still stands. This review said that the genetic evidence for climate change driven evolution is still scarce. And there's a variety of reasons that I could perhaps come to, um, come to later of why the, the evidence for uh, climate change driven evolution might be scarce. But we do have some really nice case studies. So um, this is the purple pitcher plant mosquito. And in the United States, this has been shown to shift its, the phenology of its um, diapause. That's probably due to climate change. And also um, Van Asch et al showed that the winter moth caterpillars uh, shift in their phenology um, and has been a kind of an evolutionary response. So both of these have done what are known as common garden experiments over time, where the the environmental conditions are controlled for. Okay, so that brings me back to the, the pied flycatchers. So unlike the other bird species I talked about, which are all resident breeders in the UK, the pied flycatcher has to um, migrate to West Africa and then decides to kind of fly back to Europe in March and April, which means that while it's traveling back from West Africa, it's not able to pick up on local temperatures and local conditions on its breeding grounds. So that might be part of why it has kind of shallower plasticity than the resident bird species. So what this really elegant um, experiment from Barbara Helm and colleagues did was they took, they took um, individual nestlings um, out of the nest, hand reared them over the course of a year, and then looked at their Kind of their spring and the autumn phenology in, a, in captivity, but in a very controlled environment with a fixed temperature. So again, a common garden experiment. 
But this is a common garden experiment through time again. So they did this first in 1981 and then much later in 2002. And over this 20 year period, you can see there's a shift in the timing of, uh, of male, um, male development of around about two weeks advance. So although this is a very, these are very small sample sizes they had, but I think this reflects what a painstaking challenge and experiment it must have been. But I think this is the best evidence we have for a shift in phenology of any, um, any vertebrate species, sorry, an, an evolutionary response of any vertebrate species. Okay, so coming back to the, the questions I set out earlier, are populations able to get timing right in a changing climate? Well, in terms of plasticity, we find substantial adaptive phenological plasticity in response to temperature. So there's really loads of evidence for this. There's some accumulating evidence that the optimum spring timing is getting early with warming. I think it's quite intuitive that it should be getting somewhat earlier, but what we really lack are precise estimates. And we, lack, we, we don't really have a diversity of precise estimates for a diversity of species. It's really mostly focused on birds. And where plasticity is not, a and not enough to track the, the shift in the optimum, then populations may be evolving earlier spring phenology. But again, we don't have a lot of evidence for this yet. So we don't know how fast, how able to evolve different populations are going to be. And just before I close, I just want to kind of come back to um, thinking about Darwin's tangled bank that he described uh, so beautifully. And all of the kind of all of the analyses I've been talking about today treat populations as though they are kind of they can be considered in isolation. So how does this species respond just to temperature? And yet, as I said at the very beginning of a talk, one of the really important roles of phenology is scheduling interactions with other species. And we can see this if we think about this tangled bank. So we can see the competition for light between um, these species on the, the, the herb species on the, the forest floor. So whether it's wooded enemies trying to get a head start ahead of bluebells, this competition for light, then we see a competition for light for all of them to try and um, to develop before the canopy completely covers them and shades out the light. And then amongst the tree species, we see competition between early leafing species like birch and late leafing species like oak. And all of those, uh, all of these tree species then have interactions with caterpillars that are feeding on them, birds feeding on the caterpillars. And so there's lots of potential that if different species are shifting their timings at different rates, that this could have rip effects that ripple through these whole communities. And I think the best, sorry, again, this is a very blurry slide, but the best um, illustration we have that this could be problematic comes from this lovely um, meta-analysis by Steve Thackeray and colleagues using citizen science phenology data, where they look at these three different trophic levels in the UK, primary producers, primary consumers, and secondary consumers. And you can see that the, the primary producers and the primary consumers are shifting their timings much faster than the secondary consumers, leading to leading this idea that there might be kind of increasing mismatch. And what we don't know is whether these mismatches have major consequences or is there any sort of buffering? I mean, I'm not able to answer that in any kind of robust way yet. And finally, thank you all very much for listening. And I really ought to say a big thanks to all the volunteer recorders to all of these citizen science schemes. Um, and thanks to collaborators and funders. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, that was a terrific talk and, and really clear. And I, I really like this approach that you described. It's, it's, it's really interesting, terrific. Um, I'm sure that there will be, um, you know, a, a couple of questions. So. If you've got a question, please either put your hand up um, or stick it in the chat. Uh, Jenny. Oops. I was trying to set, set my, video, turn my video off there. Thanks, Tracy. Um, Ali, that's a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, brilliant data and, and really, really thought provoking. I was thinking about um, what your plasticity metrics capture. And can I just check that I understand it correctly? So, so your plasticity metric across the species, sometimes that's you measuring it within the same individual, but your, but your temporal plasticity metric, do I understand that's at the population level? Um, yes, so, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so ideally, so, so you'd, always really, measure it at the, you'd ideally yeah. always measure at the individual level, but 
when we've slightly more finessed the analyses later, we've made it so that we've already detrended any, any kind of year trend, so that we're really looking at the kind of the fluctuations in temperature from year to year. And so I think yeah, our plasticity estimates are a bit more reliable then. Yeah, I mean, it's not that they're not reliable. I was just wondering that another component of that could be variation in which individuals are contributing to the population in any given year. So if you imagine a population of early and late individuals, and if what you've got is in a warm year, more early individuals are breeding the more late ones, then it would be a different, it wouldn't really be plasticity, right? It would just be variation in who's breeding uh, um, in, in that year. And I wondered what influence that would have uh, on, on the interpretation of these findings. You're right. I mean, that could give that could make them very biased if that were if that were the case. Um, I, I don't think it would be so problematic with things like blue tits and great tits. And uh, but I, I can easily imagine. I guess you're thinking of Godwitz and thinking yep. how it could be quite different there. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I'm not so worried about our estimates of plasticity is they at least seem to be consistent with those of the likes of the White and Woods studies. So I think we're at least we're getting the right kind of ballpark estimates. And I haven't really heard of individuals just not breed, you know, it's being some individuals that just tend not to breed because they just live so few years, don't they? Yeah, I think you're quite right that it's uh, in short-lived species, it's much less likely to be an issue than in long-lived species. But, it, but it, I guess it could have some quite big implications for how, what we infer about as what's an evolutionary process here. And, and yeah. Not. yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Right, thank you. Any any other questions for Ali? Jenny, you've still got your hand up. I think you can probably, unless you, yeah, great, thanks. Sorry, Mark, did you, Mark, did you have your hand up or do you, no, you didn't, sorry. I'll just put my video back on. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I just have a, a, a brief question for you, um, Ali, if I if I may. So um, so the I, I was wondering um, as I say, I really like the approach, but I was sort of wondering uh, the amount of plasticity that an organism is is able to express itself won't be won't show will show some sort of non-linear relationship between where they are right on the on the space and so could be quite, actually quite compressed and i was wondering whether that um is is accounted for or um or how that kind of impacts because presumably you know of course the amount of plasticity itself will have will have some limits right yeah no that's a great point um it's funny it hasn't really been explored that much in the the phenological literature i guess because people have been a bit nervous of, I guess the range of temperatures we've seen things across, linear relationships seem to work quite well. Um, I think from some of the experiments using growing degree days, there's a hint of non-linearities. Um, but I, I think it's a, it's a big question that we all need to explore a bit more, which is where are, when, when do you start to see a bend in the kind of relationship between temperature and phenology? Where are the yeah. limits? Well, I guess I was thinking, you know, following on from, um, well, the whole theme of today, you know, we haven't, we haven't, you know, things are kind of bad enough. Going in the wrong direction, populations where that amount of plasticity is kind of really, really limited, but it doesn't seem that long before we won't get there. I don't know why I'm laughing. It's not funny at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, great. Good. Um, okay, um, I don't, I don't see um, any other questions. So um, just remains for us to thank um, Ali very much indeed for a fantastic talk. Um, I have a, um, a couple of just a couple of um, closing remarks. Um, so I'll, I'll make those now if I may to close the whole session. I mean, I'd, I'd really, really like to thank our um, speakers for a terrifically stimulating afternoon. It's been um, a really um, important um, and we've had a lot of really important themes, impactful science. Um, I mean, the, the theme of our meeting this year has been um, Darwin, evolution, climate change, in, in, and um, you know, we've seen this highlighted across these very, very different scales. Um, so different geological eras, different taxa, different systems, and a series of fantastic talks and really important messages. Um, so, um, you know, of course, climate change is, is 
an existential threat. Um, and you know, understanding the processes of, of Darwin, Darwinian evolution um, seems never to be, you know, is never been more relevant in, in tackling, um, uh, well, measures, part of the measures um, to um, tackle this challenge. And also, of course, Darwinism, you know, remains the foundational, um, foundational basis of our understanding of evolution um, in general. So, you know, two, uh, 213 years after his birth in, um, in 1809, um, on Darwin Day in here now in 2022, um, you know, we can celebrate and, you know, the continuing importance and relevance and legacy of Darwin's work. Um, and so um, thank you very much for coming um, and thank you for supporting this event. And also finally, thank you also to Mark and to Lisa Marchioretto for um, uh, assisting with the, 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 the tech support. And then thanks for Mark for co-organizing this event um, with me. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye, see you next year. <laughs>